And this guy that's invited me out to film the protest says, I'm sleeping in the bed with you. It doesn't really matter who the, what the majority group is. What matters is who has the loudest voice and what are the reactions to those loudest voices. For instance, right now, I would argue it's probably still the case that the majority of real trans people in the United States are pretty reasonable, pretty chill people. But when you have these huge vocal minorities that are so loud, and it doesn't seem like anybody on the left is willing to disavow what they say. On the contrary, a lot of progressive ideas are very good, need to be talked about more. Things like racial equity, things like systemic injustices, um, things like funding for education and healthcare, um, things related to trans or LGBT issues. But it gets lost in the sauce of like insane people doing these insane things that everybody on the left turns a blind eye towards. I've wanted to do this with you since day one discussing it. I'm praying that you can forgive me for even contemplating the idea. Let me know when you're free to talk with me and the lads. Dang. What a cuck. What a pushover. I've never done a video like this before. I've written it a hundred plus times, recorded it with my teleprompter, edited it a dozen times, had friends watch it, contacted lawyers to see if I'd be able to say the things I'm saying, but I could just never hit publish. It never felt right. But I also can't go on doing the content I'm doing, talking about politics, talking about life as if it's all just normal without saying these things, without having an honest, candid conversation about the truth of my time in politics, the truth about why I left, the truth about everything around me that so many people and influencers don't want you knowing because it makes us look bad. Wow, dramatic. Where did it all begin? Um, I was born. <laughs> Stop. A family, and I had a wonderful, wonderful mother and father. We weren't particularly wealthy. I remember my first crib, I've seen a video of it, was a bathtub in my parents' one bedroom apartment. And there's, yeah, this cute video of my dad walking into the room and saying, hi, Lauren, as I'm sitting there in blankets in the tub. The eyes of a future terrorist. Look into them, recognize them in your own children, guys. Of my dad walking into the room and saying, hi, Lauren. As I'm sitting there in blankets in the tub. Thank God a pipe didn't burst. Or I wouldn't be here. But growing up in that household, I never knew anyone who was involved in any big time politics or TV or anything like that. That was like absurd. The idea that I would ever be talking to hundreds of thousands of people, the idea that I'd ever be meeting politicians, like completely out of the picture for what my life should have should have looked like. You know, a very solid working class family. And but, but my dad liked listening to political podcasts every day when I went to school. He'd put Dennis Prager on and Michael Savage, and I kind of found it all very interesting. I really enjoyed it and got into it a bit myself as well on the internet, on Tumblr, all of that. And eventually when I got to university, I decided I wanted to try doing politics as well. And I was the first one in my family to go to university. So that was really, really exciting for me. I was working like three jobs, minimum wage. It was $8 an hour then. I still can't believe it. <laughs> and I'll never forget, I was 19, driving back and forth to university and my car tank was empty. And I found $2 under the, um, under the mat in my car. And I was so excited because I was like, I don't have any money in my bank account. It's totally empty. But this $2 might be able to get me home today so I can wait for my paycheck tomorrow and get to university the next day. I was so stressed financially at that time. And oil and gas policy really pissed me off because we had just brought in all of these policies in Canada, you know, raising the carbon tax that increased prices of oil and gas. And it actually really affected me on a serious level of, am I going to be able to go to university or not? Am I gonna be able to get to work? So conservative policies on oil and gas were something that I was really interested. Anything that um, yeah, made it easier for the working class, the regular person day to day. So I joined this conference in university called Conserving Oil and Gas in Toronto. And my boyfriend at the time, who was this lovely Mennonite guy, decided to come with me. 
We flew to Toronto. It was one of maybe the second flight, second or third flight I'd been on in my life. And I was so excited to go to the big city. I got there and it was being hosted by a man named Ezra Levant. Ezra Levant. He's a source of debate, a source of controversy, a source of entertaining television. Introducing Ezra Levant only on Sun News Network. Ezra Levant, yep. Um, man, I remember watching him on TV when I was in high school. I would have been like 14 watching him on Sun News. And it's uh, just this insanely confident, always worked up guy about free speech and oh, Trudeau, the left wingers and government. I, I loved watching it with my dad. It was it was very fun. And to see Ezra Levant in person, I was full on fangirling. It was embarrassing. I had read all of his books. I brought Groundswell with me, I think, to try and get it signed by him. And not only did he come and sign it, he sat beside me at this dinner at the conference and, and talked to me for like oh, half no. an hour. And I went home just elated. Oh, never mind. So excited by the whole experience. But, you know, went back to my little life. Um, and that, that was that. That was that crazy political experience I had. And I decided, okay, you know, I'm university is getting difficult to pay for. I. I'm falling behind in my classes because I'm working so many jobs on the side. I have to kind of find a solution to this. So I decided I was going to join the army. I would filled out all the paperwork. I heard they had a program where they would pay for your university or for you to complete your university if you gave them a certain number of years. And that was going to be, you know, the best career option I could possibly have for my future. And then I got this email out of nowhere from Ezra. And it said, Lauren, I'm starting a new media company called Rebel Media, and we would love for you to contribute to it. Sun News Network is off the air. Bang, gone. That's basically what happened. Sun News Network went off the air today. Sun News Network has gone dark. The, the end of Sun News Network. Uh... Sun TV faded to dark. With Sun gone, there's a hole on the far right side of the dial. Ezra Levant fighting for freedom in Calgary. Good night. Every day the consensus media had one goal, stop Harper. That's Ezra Levant, a journalist many consider to be the solo remaining voice of the conservative right in Canada, reporting live on election night here at his website, therebel.media's brand new Toronto studio for the very first time. As you can see, it's just a box with a bunch of green screens and green blankets. I was shocked that he wanted me, of all people, the girl who came to get my book signed by him and was just starstruck drooling, to make a video for Rebel Media, his new outlet to support working class, good conservative Canadians like me and my family. I was elated by the idea and said, absolutely. I didn't think much would come of it. I looked at their channel and it had a few hundred views here and there and I figured I'm in political science, so it'll be a good opportunity to help my speaking skills, my presentation, to have this connection. But I really cared. I really wanted it to look good and to impress you know, Ezra and, and all the people working at Rebel. So I wrote a script. I called it Why I'm Not a Feminist. And it was the first video I made for Rebel. I probably filmed it 13, 14 times, eventually paid a friend to come help me do it because I wanted to get it just right. And sent it over to Rebel. Didn't expect much of it. Figured it would get a few hundred views. Went to bed. Woke up the next day and my life had changed overnight. It had not hundreds of views, not thousands of views, millions of views, millions. My friends were calling me, my friends at university were coming up to me saying, I've seen the video, Lauren, oh my gosh. I had thousands of messages in all of my inboxes on Facebook, Twitter, and in the span of 24 hours, I went from that a fangirl wanting to get her book signed by Ezra Levant and going back to my little life working a minimum wage job to being at the center of everything I was watching, commentating on, and being fascinated by from afar. 
just like that. It's hard to like bring back the memories at this point. It was, I feel like such a hectic time in my life. There were so many changes, so many eyes on me, so many opportunities that I never thought I would ever get in my life. And I was desperate to make it work. Because like I said, it's not, I wasn't set up to be a, a doctor or a lawyer or something with some massive uh, fund ready for university. This was like, if I got this opportunity and I made it work, that would change my life forever. What a gorgeous day in Vancouver. And joining us to talk about herself is Lauren Southern. Great to see you in person. Great to see you, Ezra. <laughs> Lauren, you are the number one star of the Rebel.media. Your commentary on feminism, well, it got almost uh, 600,000 views on our site, and it was pirated by other Rebel sites. offered me to have a show at that point. They said I could go out and do recordings at protests and come out to Toronto once a month to do a show standoff with Lauren Southern. We're in serious trouble if we don't get an entirely new <laughs> That's government. Serious, Jesus. If you don't protect everyone's free speech, you're going to find your own silenced at some point. Okay, not to shut on Lauren, but does it seem strange that if you were a media company, you're like, we're going to grab this 19-year-old girl and she's going to be like a big... Doesn't that seem kind of strange? Maybe? Maybe not? <clears throat> oh, <laughs> they paid for the flights. Sorry. <laughs> they paid for the flights, but they didn't pay for anything else. So... I'd use a couch surfing app and I'd stay at random people's houses, sleeping on their floors to go and do this show in Toronto. It was insane. The fact that I'm not murdered or it, it is incredible, incredible that I didn't get killed. Yeah, it really frustrates me now whenever I see people be like, oh, Lauren only got all these views and everything because she's a cute blonde girl or whatever. Like, no, I, I sacrificed a lot. I made a lot of a lot of efforts to make this work. Why? Because I cared. I deeply, deeply cared. I actually, I, I'm almost embarrassed sometimes looking back at it, but because so many people that I worked with in politics didn't actually believe in any of the politics that they spoke about. They just, it was kind of an aesthetic. A lot of people who didn't make it in acting kind of got into politics and le learned the talking points they had to say. And I was fully bought in from the start. I believed this was a, civilizational battle for the heart of the West, for goodness, righteousness, conservatism, family, Christianity. That was all something that I truly, truly believed in at the core of my heart and soul to the point where at that time I was getting kicked out of university classes for speaking up. I was, you know, threatening my work. I almost lost my job, you know, going, having to take so many days off to go and do these videos for Rebel. And I didn't make any money, not a dime, not a dime off any of it. Just to clarify, so people don't think I'm lying about this, after my first video went viral, Rebel did offer to pay me a stipend of $100 per video. <laughs> this kind of shit reminds me, um, <laughs> in the early days of like esports and shit, when none of us had any idea like what any of our shit was worth, you'll get these companies that will pay you like, oh my God, like $50 or $100 for videos that we be getting six figure, sometimes seven figure views. Um, this is probably true of every like fledgling internet industry. You never really know how much you're worth until you've been getting fucked for a long time. Yeah, there was the machinima days where they would like contract kids into infinity and stuff and they'd like rip them off with how much they'd be willing to pay them and stuff. Um, I totally believe this. They'd offer like a hundred dollars. I'm pretty sure some of these early videos too got like. Um... Didn't that feminism get like over a million views or something? Fuck, I'm not gonna be able to find it now. That there was one she did where she walks around with that stupid fucking sign. Oh no, it was the or was it like the, the rape culture isn't real? Do these videos even exist anymore? Do they get deleted? It's Rebel News. I feel like she had a couple that were like like over a million views. And the idea that you get paid like a hundred dollars <laughs> for I like I feel like a I feel like good faith would be to at least like reach out and offer more money to the people for, you know, like, hey, this video did way better than we thought it would. Like maybe we can like, you know, bump your pay up to like a thousand dollars or even at least like a few hundred dollars more as like a, a show of good faith. But I don't know. But the problem was Wait, slut walk video. So is it any- 
Good job. <clears throat> hey everyone. Okay, so I'm this is in 2017. I don't know if this isn't what I'm thinking of. There, there are older ones, but why I am not a feminist? Oh, it might have been this one. 1.2.5, 1.25 million views. Damn. They were paying for fully produced and edited products. So I had to hire an editor who I was paying a minimum of 120 to $200 per video for. It got to the point where I was struggle bussing it so bad with zero dollars in the bank, I would have to make him wait until I got my paycheck from my university job, Cascades Casino, or EV Games, before I could pay him. So all- <laughs> Imagine walking in <laughs> EB Games, Lauren Southern. That sounds very- all of those videos I did where I got millions of views that would have gotten thousands of dollars in ad revenue, I lost money making them. Eventually, after some months of working, Rebel did give me a full-time job there Copy and that. would cover hotels, etc. So I saw this all as worth it, but I had to fight for it for sure. Every... When did it become popular for girls to do that thing? Where the fuck did this come from? And when did it start? You guys know what I'm talking about? They do it in pictures too. I have no idea. I maybe had flights covered sometimes, but I paid for all of those videos I made at the very beginning with <laughs> like the zero dollars that I had. Um, Asia, anime. No one was talking about this stuff at the time. There weren't, I mean, YouTube was still, YouTube had been around for a while, but most videos on YouTube were Fred Smosh people making funny, silly little skits, and then the news was just the news. It was, okay, there's been a traffic jam here, and this bill has been signed, or whatever. There wasn't this massive sphere of political creators and streamers and all these little media Name companies drop. that had become, you know, online entities, and they weren't talking about these controversial hot-button issues, like feminism going wild in universities at the time men being told they were evil being told that you're a horrific awful person for being white what really triggered a lot of this for me was taking the first social justice class that was introduced to my high school curriculum in canada in grade 12 and they split us at the lockers based on how you were if you were privileged or oppressed and i was put on the privileged side just because i was white and I remember looking at people across on the other side of the lockers that I knew had extremely wealthy, privileged backgrounds that had been put on the oppressed side and thinking, this is madness. This is insanity. What world are we living in? And why is no one talking about this? And so obviously I'm like, yeah, I want to make these videos for Rebel. Yeah, we need to be talking about this. And man, I was so passionate about it all. And I, I just didn't realize at the time that I don't know, that, that passion I had as kind of the little guy coming into that big world wasn't as organic for a lot of the players that already existed in the world of politics. <laughs> Joke's on me, I entered politics and didn't realize it was full of liars and frauds. Wow, surprise, surprise, but... Okay, so anyways, I could get into all of that for a while, but um, obviously one thing I wondered when I first started making these videos for Rebel was, am I just a one trick pony? Is this just going to be why I'm not a feminist? Millions and millions of views and then no one cares about anything else. But that didn't end up being the case. In fact, I started going to protests <laughs> like an absolute crazy person and counter protesting these feminists and asking them questions about their ideology and philosophy. And those videos went absolutely viral as well. Lauren Southern crashes Vancouver slut walk. Lauren Southern crashes Alberta slut walk. Whatever they were. People loved these on the street questioning protesters videos. No means no! No means no! No means no! You are attacking our cameraman! The whole point of the walk is the protest rape culture. I think that video went so viral at the time because not a lot of politics is being done that way. Today, you have a thousand different people on the streets going to protests with live streams. It's like extremely common to the point where it's like saturated to go to protests. But at that time, no one had really seen it before. Commentators, political pundits, your place was behind a desk. You told people your opinions after the event happened. You didn't go to the event and then opine or cause commotion at said event, especially on YouTube. It just didn't really exist that much at the time. I don't want to say I'm the first, 
because that's conceited and I'm probably not, but one, one of the first people on YouTube doing that for sure, which was, yeah, just a wild experience. Um, of course, of course, when I figured that was the kind of commentary people liked and that was the critique of feminism that was working, that was getting people talking about, wow, these feminists don't really have their ideas all together. There's some serious contradictions going here, some serious flaws, right? I decided to keep hammering that hard. And one opportunity I got was to go down to Los Angeles to the Amber Rose Slut Walk. And not only the Amber Rose Slut Walk, but to meet another hero of mine, Milo Yiannopoulos. I could not say no to an opportunity to meet Milo Yiannopoulos, to work on a project with him, and to go to another one of these slut walks where we could criticize this massive feminist enterprise that was ruining the lives of so many good people I knew. And <laughs> this is a good segue for getting into the story of the Amber Rose slut walk. But um, one of the big reasons I didn't like feminism was because I had so many good men in my life. My father is an incredible man, love him to death, such a good dad. The men around me at my church, the men who were my friends in, in high school and elementary school, even the men that I dated at the time, like wonderful, wonderful people, truly. And to see them being portrayed as evil rapists and misogynists and bad for women really angered me. Most men are rapists. <laughs> By that, I mean most cis heteronormative men. The of only answer to that is to kill male babies and um, just kill any man that you see, like in the streets, like any swing dick, just kill him. It, it really, really, truly upset me at the time. It's a little unhinged. And I didn't really understand this visceral hatred and distrust towards the world and men that feminists had at all. It wasn't my lived experience, uh, which, which brings me into how I got to the Amber Rose slut walk. So of course, flying to LA, couldn't afford that. Staying at a hotel, could not afford that. I've explained this already. And I was lucky enough that an individual who was involved in the anti-feminist sphere had sent me an email. I think it was even under the, a fake name like John Doe or something. And this is how trusting I was. He just offered, Lauren, if you're willing to come down here, I'll pay for your flight. Oh, I'll no. pay for a place for you to stay. You'll be all good and sorted, right? And I, all I want basically is for you to make this content criticizing these crazy feminists. This cultural issue is so important for me that I'm willing to fund your trip. Amazing opportunity. I think I even messaged him back and I was like, thank you so much. Yeah, we can hang out, play some video games, have a glass of wine and go to the, go to the <laughs> protest the next day. Of course, my... My 19 year old brain had no conception, no conception whatsoever, no idea of red flags that I'm gonna go meet a strange guy in a different city and go stay at a hotel that he sets me up at. Like just, <laughs> the red flags would be obvious. Now I look back and I'm like, you dumb bitch. But then it seemed all perfectly fine to me. Um, <laughs> I land in LA meet this guy he takes me to my airbnb and it's barely an airbnb it's like actually just like some harry potter ass closet that someone has made in their apartment with like a a draw curtain in the side of the wall a cubby if you will and i go to go to bed because I, I arrived super late in los angeles it's like 10 p.m there or something and this guy that's invited me out to film the protest says, I'm sleeping in the bed with you. I, I just did not even compute. I didn't understand. I was like, oh, no, 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 I, I, I'd like to sleep in the bed myself. And he said, no, I paid for this bed. I will be sleeping in the bed with you. This guy must have been watching the Destiny Rape Guides because that's how you do it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I don't know, I, I was so panicked, so shocked by this situation. I didn't really know how to respond. I think I made something up about how, oh, maybe, maybe tomorrow or something. I just really need to get sleep tonight. I'm not feeling well, please leave, please leave. And I finally got him to leave the Airbnb, but I was absolutely terrified. Terrified that someone would, obviously now, you know, looking back, I can see why someone would think that, but me, 19 year old me, like when I was younger, I was like, 
why, why would someone fly me out here to do something political with the expectation that I was going to sleep with them? That's like crazy to me. They didn't say anything about that. I didn't say anything about that. Why would they, why would they put me in that situation? Um, if I could go back in time and slap myself and tell myself to be a less trusting individual, I would. I would, because I put myself in a lot of really unfortunate situations politically because of this naive trust I had. Um, sadly enough, probably some of these feminists that still, I think, have insane ideas in a lot of ways, but some of them probably would have given me the same warning. Just they, they took that lived experience to such an extreme that they made it impossible to communicate to anyone else who hadn't lived it. And it, it makes me angry looking back at some of the radical feminists that I confronted when I think, if you guys had just been more reasonable with how you presented things, if you hadn't made it all men, if you hadn't sat around and demonized an entire sex and told me they were all rapists and been hysterical with how you presented your ideas, then maybe me and other women would have actually listened to the real criticisms of the world and gender dynamics that you had, some of the important lessons you had. I, it makes me really mad because there are things that feminists say that are true. There are power dynamics that exist. There are situations that women can get themselves in where they'll be in danger. And all of those warnings fall on deaf ears when you put them in the context of... Fuck, I don't know how much I want to push back on chat on this because I know that anything I say will be perceived as being uh, simp-filled, but uh, this is one trillion percent correct. Um, if you're out there screeching insane shit like kill all men, which you can pretend it's not socially acceptable to say it, but it is, and it was for a long period of time to say shit like that, or things like, you know, all white people are racist, blah, 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 you can't really be surprised when people don't listen to anything you say. Um, I would argue, actually, I said this back in 2013, um, when it came to the word f one of the reasons why it took me so long to move off of that word um, was because most of the people that would screech at me that I shouldn't say that because it's homophobic, most of them would say that like, you're only saying this because you hate gay people. Like every time you say this, it, it reveals how homophobic and hate, hateful of gay people you are. And it's like, I don't hate gay people. Why would I even listen to anything you have to say? Who said that? You're, never mind. I won't, I'm not taking the bait. Um, were those people a majority of the feminist movement? So I think this is an issue that you have to contend with and it's not fair, but it doesn't matter. This is what you have to deal with when you need to be politically effective because you see the same thing happen with the trans movement today. You're seeing it happen more and more. It doesn't really matter who the what the majority group is. What matters is who has the loudest voice and what are the reactions to those loudest voices. That's the issue that you're having. Because for instance, right now, I would argue it's probably still the case that the majority of real trans people in the United States are pretty reasonable, pretty chill people. But when you have these huge vocal minorities that are so fucking loud, and it doesn't seem like anybody on the left is willing to disavow what they say, on the contrary, they'll follow them lockstep and enforce all the crazy shit coming from them. Um, well, I mean, you can't really at the end of the day go, well, hold on, that's just a vocal minority. Okay, well, no one's calling anybody out, right? If you were in a group with 10 people and two guys started to rape a woman and the other eight people stood by and watched and people were like, what the fuck? What are you guys doing? And it's like, well, it was only a minority of us raping anybody. Like, I mean, you can't really hold us accountable for that. It was just two guys. What the fuck? The other eight of us were just like standing there. Like, well, yeah, what the fuck do you think? Um, this is a revelation I came to a while ago about the libs of TikTok shit, where I'm kind of, I try to wonder, like, why do people let a minority voice control the narrative? How does this happen? And it's not the minority voice that's controlling the discourse. It's the majority that doesn't respond to the minority that is pulling people in the other direction. For instance, when it comes to like the four-year-old trans kids people, Everybody is very quick to say, and, and I've been involved in personal drama, not personal drama, I've been involved in fights on my own where this happens. People will say things like, okay, it's the minority of people saying that like four-year-olds can be trans destiny. So that's not fair to point out. But the problem is that the minority of people that are saying it, it's the majority of people that are defending it. Because when it comes to some of this stuff, if like 95% of people on the left, when somebody comes out like, oh, my four-year-old is trans, and if ever, and of all progressive people on the left were like, yeah, that woman's kind of weird. That's a little bit crazy. That's probably not, probably not like the best thing to say. Then I don't think conservatives have anywhere near as much ammo, except for that's not the response from the left. The response is to defend them viciously to the death. And then when you accuse them at the end of being like insane, you go, well, it's just a minority of people doing it. The problem isn't the minority of people doing it. It's the majority of people defending it and running defense for it. That's the issue, you know? Um, 
I think the other side will also latch onto crazy things, amplify it, and that causes shit to be a bit more prone. I don't think that's necessarily true. I've used that excuse for myself in the past, but I don't think it's true. Like, all, and it's hard for me because I'm only human. But it's hard for me to keep track of this. People will say things like, Destiny, um, you can't do this particular type of behavior. And sometimes in anger, in the past, I've responded to, um, I've responded to this by saying, no matter what I say or do, people are going to take me out of context. People are gonna say these crazy things about me anyway. Literally, no matter what, people are gonna take whatever I say to context, people do whatever. To some extent, that's true. That is true to some extent. August helped me see this too. That is true to some extent. No matter what I do, there's always gonna be some group of people that are gonna take me out of context. But you don't do yourself any favors by acting in an unhinged manner like other people say you will. Or if you act in the ways that people say you do, you're gonna lose a lot of people that you wouldn't notice otherwise, right? Like maybe there are 10 people that take me out of context. I'm like, well, what the fuck was the point? I should have just acted unhinged. Well, then you act unhinged and now 100 people take you out of context. It's like, okay, well, see, they did it the same anyway, but there is a difference, you know? Destiny, I disagree people are running defense for the insane minority. It's more of a turning a blind eye to that group. It's the same thing though. If you turn a blind eye to that group, people are gonna assume that you support it. That's always gonna be the case. Um, there is a lot to be said for progressive messaging. I would still, um, I don't know why, but I would still consider myself a, a, a pretty hardcore progressive. I think that a lot of progressive messaging is uh, not messaging. Ideas are very good and need to be talked about more. Things like racial equity, things like systemic injustices, um, things like funding for education and healthcare, um, things related to trans or LGBT issues. I think there's a lot of stuff here that needs to be talked about, but it gets lost in the sauce of like insane people doing these insane things that everybody on the left turns a blind eye towards. And I'm worried because we're seeing like over and over and over again, like I think at the university levels, it's like gotten to be, it's like almost too much. Um, it's, 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 it's almost, it, or, or maybe it's past being too much to where like that battle is actually lost at this point. Um, I remember that that Thomas guy, it was interesting, the guy that debated, <laughs> The guy that debated Vosh, that came out of my stream that I argued with, um, that guy was saying, one of the things that's scary at the university level is that as people keep retiring out and new people are brought in, a lot of the culture is hardcore shifting because of the newer people brought in. As the newer people keep getting brought in, the culture moves more and more, and it becomes an unwinnable battle at some point. And that article that we read <coughs> yesterday about the guy that was retiring because his the fellow anthropology dude got basically destroyed in the university also echoed a similar thing that as new people are brought in as people look to like bring in more ideologically compliant people that you're going to see the culture shift more and more and the um and the uh the pro pro the progressive ideology is unbelievably intolerant which normally is kind of whatever but when you're intolerant and you have a lot of institutional power, that's really scary. Um, conservatives are really intolerant, but in terms of like culture, I don't care about cult conservative intolerance. Like you guys, you don't have the levers of any culture anymore, so it doesn't matter. But when progressives are intolerant, they have the ability to destroy tons of lives and get official backing doing it, which is really scary. Um, one of the trans emails said something similar. Once the original LGBTQA leader of their conservative school left, the new people took over and ruined it. Yeah. People keep talking about this pendulum swinging back. And I've said that. I don't actually think the pendulum will swing back. I don't think that's going to happen. I think that what's going to continue to happen is instead of a pendulum swinging back, there's going to be uh, more schisming. I think that's what's going to happen. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that people are going to keep breaking off more and more and more and more and more and more and more. And then they're going to like get into their own... Right-wingers have a lot of power culturally, sorry to say this. Uh, right-wingers have no more cultural power anymore. Um, I think right-wingers have lost cultural power at, at almost in every, I'm trying to think of a single medium, maybe on talk radio, maybe right-wingers still have some cultural power. Um, but uh, yeah, otherwise, yeah, they, they, they have nothing. They absolutely do. Where? In what domains? Where, where, is, the, where is the cultural power of conservatives at? Dude, in the state you live in, I bet every university here is probably crazy left wing. Are you just talking legislatively? Legislatively, conservatives still have some power, obviously. Um, they probably will come next election cycle, but that's different than um, that's different than um, culturally. When I say cultural, I'm talking like entertainment, music. Um, 
I guess like just like st stuff that you see in, in any of the areas you engage in in like an entertainment way, I guess. Um, so like music, movies, TV shows, social media on the internet, um, art. They pass legislation enforcing their cultural values, LeMay, when they work. They absolutely don't work, dude. You look at how much the president was crying about like amending Section 230 to try to get like more shit on Facebook change so the conservatives would start getting banned everywhere. Uh, I, hold on. This is, I don't think this is a real argument. You're, you're dead wrong. W like, where do I see, like, where do I, like, cult conservative movies are a joke. What, God's Not Dead 1, 2, and 3? Um, there, there is no conservative art anywhere because conservatives just gave up on art for their own stupid fucking reasons. Um, I, I, like, I, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that conservatives don't have any power legislatively. They do, absolutely, in some places. They might get it all back in government, too, and they have it in the Supreme Court. But culturally, um, conservatives have just given up on it for, for uh, that whole other host of reasons, but... Um, people are going to keep saying this over and over again, like terrible Tim, everything is internet destiny. I feel like you guys are going to be like 80 years old where you have to like log into your refrigerator just to open it. And you'll be like, Oh, I remember those kids keep saying everything is internet. Like, I'm sorry if like, I know some of you, it bothers you, but like it is, it's all trending in one direction with like it getting more and more and more and more and more and more popular and ever present and omnipresent and pervasive in every aspect of your life. Like you can pretend like it's quote unquote, just the internet, but then in the next breath, you'll echo things like the access to the internet should be a human right that should be a human right guaranteed by the un and the united states like it's you can't you can't keep turning a blind eye to it or you can and you can just lose everywhere too if that's what you want but all right sorry back to this <clears throat> and all of those warnings fall on deaf ears when you put them in the context of the point is is that the average person isn't out there in the twitter trenches i would say that at this point it seems like in the in the universities a lot of this stuff is becoming quite ubiquitous that seems to be the case in the universities so for and then in terms of so here's two areas that i've seen it like outside of the internet one are universities and two is corporate culture so if that's the case if it's ubiquitous among corporate culture and university. Um, I think I mentioned before, I had two people emailing me because I was, I said a while ago that like, I think the BIPOC stuff is going away. I don't think anybody uses BIPOC anymore. And I had two people emailing me that were saying like, hey, I know that you said this is the case, but in the corporate world, like everybody uses BIPOC. This is something that we talk about a lot at HR and all this shit or whatever. I don't know if that's true. It was only two people. Maybe it was only in their companies. When I mentioned this yesterday, everybody in chat or some people in chat were saying like, oh yeah, we say that a lot too. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think that, um, like, I think it worked five or six or seven years ago, but I don't think you can keep burying your head in the sand and screeching. It's just, it's just corporate, or it's just uh, the internet. It's only Twitter. It's just, it's just the internet, blah, blah, blah. Like, we see this shit show up in real life, right? W were the Covington kids, like, was that just the internet? Or um, any other number of, like, stupid, like, the BLM riots, that wasn't just the internet, right? Um, <clears throat> Like the videos of like like Chaz was that just the internet? Didn't that end up with two people dead? Um, I don't I don't think you can just keep saying that these things are just the internet, but ridiculous, exaggerated talking points of all men are evil, right? CRT stuff, would you classify as culture? What about backlash to transgender stuff in Southern states? Is none of this culture, the issues relating to statutes and textbooks? No, I would call that legislation. Conservatives can't push back anywhere culturally. When you, you don't, I don't think of legislation as culture, right? Nobody, no, the conservatives have no representation in culture. They just don't. I'm sorry, they just don't. Now, and I'm, I'm not even blaming progressives for that. Conservatives have their whole host of like stupid fucking reasons for abandoning that shit, for abandoning everything for abandoning everything. Because I was gonna say, I almost said yesterday that like conservatives decided to focus on STEM over like art, but that's not true either. Conservatives are just fucking <laughs> dumb. They just have their whole, they they I, they like totally disengaged from everything in academia and they don't have like science engineering or fucking, um, or, or I, yeah, I don't know, Jesus. Yeah, we had, it's a huge split in the United States, but. Does having a hold on over 50% of your state do nothing for you culturally? I don't know how you can win elections. Well, where is your, um, what, like states don't produce like media generally. I mean, I guess you can argue there might be local culture in some areas, but okay. Ridiculous, exaggerated talking points of all men are evil, right? So it makes me very sad looking back and wishing that I could have had reasonable conversations with these women. It was probably half my fault, half theirs, right? But um, 
So I was pretty shaken up the next morning after the whole guy who invited me confronting me and asking to sleep in my bed, but I'd gotten an invite from Milo to go meet him and his assistant at a restaurant in LA, and there was no way I wasn't gonna show up to that. So I put on the nicest dress I owned. I showed up to this restaurant and it was the most opulent thing I had ever seen in my life at that point. I mean, the conservatives I hung out with at home, I met them at church and I met them at farms. I went to university at a place called University of the Fraser Valley, which was out in Chilliwack and Abbotsford. If you're Canadian or from BC, you'll know what I'm talking about. My conservative mates were you know, manure hauling, cow farming, chicken farming, friends of mine that were riding around on tractors, not going to opulent restaurants in Los Angeles. So this was a whole new world to enter. I didn't even know there were conservatives that did this, that were cool, so to speak, right? And I guess Milo was kind of one of the first to start that culture of let's have conservatives that are into fashion, that are cool, that are gay, that are this, right? So that was a very surprising and somewhat galling but obviously amazing experience for me we talked for hours we talked about Breitbart um Milo gave me so much advice on what to do and me fuck hold on I want to go back and forth the chat a lot because I don't want to do that anyways. conservatives still have large camps in econ business and less so in stem I um I thought that and I've said that a few times on stream but every time I say that I'll get somebody emailing me to push back against that where they'll say like hey I know you have this impression that econ departments or finance departments or business parts are like super conservative but that's not true most of them are like center left democrats like center left liberals that's like the vast majority of those people um I don't know if that's true but that's usually that's the pushback that I get when somebody emails me because I had the impression I know when I was going to school when I was in college in 2008 you know it, it was always the idea that like econ departments are like very conservative they're the most conservative place in schools maybe that was true 15 years ago but now everybody that emails me is like most of these people are going to be like your coastal elite center left liberals like yeah they might be a little bit conservative on like fiscal policy but like socially these people are all super left-leaning you're not getting like a or not super left-leaning but like left-leaning it would have been super left-leaning 10 years ago but like left-leaning people that you're not going to find a bunch of people in college campuses and econ departments like dick riding trump or something um yeah but, but maybe, maybe not. I don't know. That's just what I get emails. I haven't been to school in a long time. Breitbart, um, Milo gave me so much advice on what to do in media and politics. Advice that I look back on now, and I, I don't know how good it was. But I, yeah, I was, I was very overwhelmed by the whole experience. But I remember being quite thankful that Milo was sympathetic to my situation with the Airbnb guy and said, "Listen, come stay with us." Don't worry about it. Like that's that's really crazy and creepy. We'll keep an eye out uh, for you, uh, so that you know you don't have to worry about this creepy guy trying to take advantage of you. So the next day, this this guy, I, I tell the guy I don't want to stay in his Airbnb anymore. I don't worry about it, bud. Like just stay away from me. This is really creepy. He has an absolute freak out. Like yelling at me. He starts going into his Skype messages. He starts going on. Uh, his little like Twitter DMs with all of these different anti-feminist groups and basically saying I'm a fraud. I'm this horrible, horrible fraud that was actually just a, terrible in person, right? And this was the first time I had experienced something like this from someone that was supposed to be like my friend, my side of the aisle. I'm standing up for you, man. I'm criticizing feminism for people like you. And now you are acting the way that these feminists would portray a man why is this happening and that was a, a really upsetting experience for me wait but did she say who this was that, that passed i kind of shook it off as a one-off that's a one-off thing this guy was a little crazy but you know 99.9 percent .9 of men are good people who would never do something like that no, no. anyways it's the next day milo alum and i uh and a film team go to the Ambrose Slut Walk. It is a gorgeous sunny day out so you got girls everywhere wearing nothing Boobs out, tape on. Based. Um, and Milo and I are ready for chaos. We've made these very offensive signs, horrendously offensive, that are like Harry Potter and rape culture. What do they have in common? Neither are real, you know? Just absolutely inflammatory stuff. And we show up at this event, and of course, after we've done a few interviews, bring out our signs, and these girls go wild they are losing their minds they're twerking on us they're trying to steal our signs they're trying to attack us the police get called we're getting dragged out by the police and i remember just being so full of adrenaline 
I think I even said to Milo, like, let's stay, let's get arrested, let's do it. And I think the only reason we didn't stay and get put in handcuffs was because Milo and I were both foreign citizens and we would have been banned from traveling if we got arrested and got criminal records in, in the US. So we walked out, but we still got some amazing footage. All right, so why are you guys out here today at the Slut Walk? Beautiful ladies. Of course, beautiful ladies. Amber Rose. Amber. <laughs> Amber, so all of you just came out here to see all the chicks scantily clad? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> it's a great cause. I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all for the sluts. <laughs> we went back to Based. this apartment we were all staying and just quickly emailing off the footage, getting it all edited, prepared for release, just so excited by this. Look at these crazy feminists. They're attacking us. They can't even have a conversation. They're ripping up our signs. They're calling the police. That was the content that really shocked people at the time, right? Because it, that, that going on the ground and actually confronting another person about their ideas in this environment, it, it was very new. And we are just sitting there hanging out after, so excited about it all. I, I remember, yeah, we went to a bar or something after, and it was just Milo, Alam, and I. And I got along super well with Milo and Alam, particularly Alam. He was such a sweet guy. I remember we're both, I was, I cannot stress enough what a dork I was before I got into this political world. I went to anime conventions, you know, video games, read tons of fantasy. I was into all that stuff. And Alan was a bit dorky too and liked politics. So we got along really well. He'd laugh at my jokes, talk about, you know, all, all of these different animes that he had seen as well. And, you know, we, we stayed in contact for like weeks, months after that and got along really well. We had a fantastic friendship. Cut for a second, went on a long unnecessary rant here. Just gonna give you the TLDR. Alam and I went on a few dates in December of 2015. I ended things. Obviously, like any normal person, Alam was upset. And when venting to a mutual friend of ours, made a joke that he could leak a ton of my offensive messages to the press or public if he wanted to. I'm talking like old classic 2015 4chan memes. And when my friend told me this, he made it sound like the most serious, dire thing in the world. And I truly thought my reputation was about to be destroyed. My life destroyed, the political career I had barely even started yet. Joke's on me, I ended up making all of those offensive memes my political career anyways, but um, none of that ever happened. Alam never leaked anything on me. He actually ended up apologizing for the fact that we fell out and I to him as well. And we're really, really good friends to this day. And to me, this really speaks to the all or nothing view of relationships that my generation has been sold by overzealous feminists on the one hand and right wingers on the other. We're told we have to see entire sexes as either completely villainous or completely pure. And to interpret bad moments in our relationships as moral outrages, the end of the world, injustices that must be answered. At the same time, there's the ever present fear of being quote unquote, canceled online for whatever reason of having the worst sides of ourselves or even just embarrassing sides being dragged into the public eye. It creates this fear in relationships that wasn't really there in the pre-digital era before it became just a trivial thing to broadcast to a global audience. In reality, relationships are messy. Bad breakups happen. People who really liked each other end up not liking each other for a while. And then time goes by and you're friends. That's exactly what happened with Alam. We're really good friends now. He's honestly one of the few people in politics that I would point to as an example of, man, that person stuck to their morals. They're a stand-up guy. If you watch the televised breakups of celebrities, you may be convinced that bad breakups and angry words mean you have to be enemies for life. It really doesn't have to be that way. But at the time, I'm sure both Alam and I felt that way. And so I turned to Milo out of genuine fear. And Milo was really, really comforting. Spoke to Alam, got him to come back to London. He's like, don't worry, Lauren, I've calmed him down. It's all okay. Close that chapter, or so I thought. Okay, so from this point, Months go by and Milo's career is just skyrocketing. He's uncontactable, haven't heard from him in ages. He's on every TV screen. He's going on Bill Maher, speaking at every campus in America, protests every day, just insane. I'm at home just picking up groceries 
And out of nowhere, I get a call from him. I remember being in a parking lot in Walnut Grove and just seeing Milo calling my phone. I pick up and the man is just frantic. He's talking about Alan Bokhari, of all people again, saying, Lauren, this is terrible. Alam has joined the left. He is working for Antifa. He is trying to leak all of my documents. He is trying to ruin my life. He's trying to take down the right wing. Don't you remember how horrible he was to you last year? This man is insane and he is going to ruin my life. I've got contacts with Azalea Banks. I've got all of these celebrities. He's got their phone numbers. He's got their messages. He's going to leak them all to the far left media. He is trying to take down the conservative movement and I need your help. I know he said horrible things to you or your cameraman. Any blackmail you have will help me right now. It will help me stop this far left attack on, on me that will destroy my life. And of course, I, I hadn't really spoken to Alam in a while. Um, I had no reason to disbelieve Milo. He hadn't provided any proof for this, but he was Milo Yiannopoulos. He was the head of the conservative movement. Of course, what he's gonna do and what, you know, his word is God's will at this point if you're a young conservative watching politics, right? It's Milo. So I just say, of course, Milo, like, of course, I'll help you out. That's crazy. I have no idea why Alan would do that, but let me see if I can find some things. And uh, that was that. I didn't hear from Milo for ages afterwards. And I didn't, at the time, I didn't know what came of all that. I just, I, I remember so clearly that one call from Milo saying, I need blackmail right now, Lauren. This guy is a far left spy. I need help and I need you to show your allegiance basically to, to me and the conservative movement. Now, I'm gonna have to bring you forward um, a little bit from here because it wasn't until years later that I discovered everything Milo said on that call to me about Alan Bokhari was completely false. Completely false, just made up out of thin air. Why, you may ask? Well, and some of this is publicly available information now due to lawsuits, but Alan Bokhari had written just about everything that made Milo famous. He wrote his book, Dangerous, the most popular one, which he was owed a whole lot of money for in royalties. He wrote his speeches. He wrote his articles for Breitbart. He wrote his talking points for shows he went on. Alan Borkari is a freaking genius, actually an extremely talented guy, but none of that was appreciated apparently because as soon as Alan wanted to get paid for all the work he did, Milo decided it would be easier to blackmail him that's right. Milo did not want to pay Alam royalties for the book he wrote, and he figured it would be easier to call up people like me, call up friends and coworkers, and ask them all for any blackmail he could get on Alan Bokhari so he could go to him and say, listen, I'm not going to pay you royalties and you're not going to say a word about it or go to court or I'm going to destroy your life with blackmail. What kind of a way is that to operate? I still like, it, it's crazy because looking at this, it's like, what the f who does that to people? And somehow this is still more sane than half the shit we're going to get to in this video. But I just, I had this moment in my life when I started to see this stuff Absolute over Chad and over moment again around me of thinking, is this normal? Is this how normal people behave? Is this just what adults do? Is this what happens with regular celebrities in law offices and like what? What world have I entered that people behave in this manner towards one another? <laughs> and it somehow all gets worse. It somehow all gets worse because truly this sort of behavior, I hate to say it because I put so much of my life and time and belief and my heart into conservative politics, but so much of this was the norm, just the norm, the norm day to day, what people just did to each other all the time in this sphere and if you weren't the one that was blackmailing other people if you weren't the one that was ruining other people's lives to save your own ass then you were the one getting your life ruined for the most part it was one or the other and you know <laughs> just while i'm on the topic of sociopathic behavior in politics and support staff getting their lives ruined to save face for you know, the big famous people at the front that'll razzle and dazzle the audience. Um, let's talk about the white privilege grant. Some of you may remember this at 2017, man, the years have all meshed together, but Milo Yiannopoulos started a grant called the white privilege grant to help poor young men. 
white men. Obviously, there are a million grants for black men, there are a million grants for women, Latina, mothers, whatever it be, but there are a whole heck of a lot of poor, rural, white people in America that have no grants for them. So it was a really cool opportunity for conservatives to give and help some people that have kind of been left behind and forgotten in society, right? And don't have anything for them. So a lot of people gave money. It was over $100,000 people gave to Milo Yiannopoulos to create this this uh, white privilege grant, he called it in a, in a cheeky way. Months and months and months went by after he collected these donations, though, and no one seemed to know what was happening with them. No mm. one seemed to know how the grant was being given, how to apply for it, what was going on. And Milo, thankfully, had hired a very organized woman named Margaret McLennan, who was big in the Gamergate days, uh, to run, run this white privilege grant. She sent emails. She, you know, made sure all the money was supposed to go where it was supposed to, set the website up, all these different things. Uh, and when questions started being asked about where all the money had gone, Milo Yiannopoulos told us all that out of nowhere, Margaret McLennan had just lost her mind and ruined the privilege grant, made it all fall apart, started to spread rumors about Milo and tried to ruin his life. I guess uh, much like Alam, she was just another woman that had suddenly turned to the far left and become a spy for them and uh, was, was trying to ruin Milo. And we believed it. I don't know why. I don't know why. I still believed things Milo told me. Imagine people still believe me when I say everybody around me is crazy. <laughs> At that point, I had some sort of Stockholm syndrome of him being like the head of the conservative movement, the biggest figure in there, and everything he said was just like God's word, right? But I, I remember even talking to people and being like, oh yeah, that Margaret McLennan chick, she, she's a bit crazy, isn't she? She went crazy on Milo. Milo warned me about her. And even without any evidence or facts, you just believed what Milo told you. <laughs> and once again, it wasn't until months and months later that I discovered Margaret had tried to tell her side of the story, but she just didn't have the platform for it. She had tried to tweet out the evidence. She had tried to explain what happened to the privilege grant, but most people didn't see it because she wasn't the one with the Breitbart byline. She wasn't the one with millions of viewers. She was just the support staff that got thrown under the bus. Margaret didn't steal any of the money. In fact, she published actual receipts, actual emails showing all of the money got transferred into Milo Yiannopoulos' bank account. And now I'm proud to be one of the loudest voices criticizing the grant after I found what I believe to be internal mishandling. My name was removed from marketing materials and Milo later attempted to shift blame for mismanagement of the grant onto me. My access as director was restricted to answering emails forwarded from the grant site where- It might be the case that like, this is maybe not true, that like people are, no, actually, hold on. I was going to say something. I say, the thing that you're taking the most, when people turn into scammers or whatever, they don't just scam once or twice. Like, do like one or two, like, slick scams and then be done with it. But they'll just like, keep going and going and going. And I was going to say, well, maybe the people that are smart enough to do it once or twice just would never scam in the first place. But it could be that the, there are people that do scam once or twice and you just never hear about it because they don't get caught. Maybe. Who knows? I directed prospective applicants to wait, and I directed donors to wire money to a personal bank account owned by Annopolis. The paperwork to sign ourselves as a charity was kicked down the road, and the grant was only addressed in public after major fundraising drives, when I spoke up to left-wing outlets in an effort to make sure the raised money would end up in the bank accounts of college students. He took all of it. He stole hundreds of thousands of dollars from working-class Americans to give to poor, white, young men who needed the help, and he just took it and then blamed his support staff, Margaret, ruining her life and her reputation so we could keep the money. And everyone just let that slide. Everyone just let it slide. I'm, I'm sorry, I just, it's like all so shocking looking back on it. Yeah, yeah, I didn't find out, like I just believed Milo. I believed Milo at the time about Alam. I believed Milo at the time about Margaret. And this is a bit of a premonition for the future of this video, but whenever I look forward and I feel bad for myself, when a bunch of people believed stories about me that ended up, or are false, I feel less bad for myself because I realized I played into this culture of, you know. What if the big reveal in this video is that Lauren wasn't the one on the boat, it was her sister, but they just look kind of similar at nighttime. Just believing what the popular figures in the right wing said about people. Oh, you're a, that, they're an Antifa spy, write them off. I just believe it. And then it happened to me and a bunch of people just believed it and didn't look into it further. And I was so shocked and offended and surprised. It's like, well, no, I did the same thing. 
people, we all think we're the party of facts and logic. We all think we're the, you know, we're, we're the right wing. We, we care about the receipts. We care about the reality. But then we have a lot of cult-like dynamic, or had, still have a lot of cult-like dynamics of our own. Not like the omni-liberals, guys. We're better than that. Where we don't really look into things that deeply if the saints of our movement say it. And, um, yeah, for how proud I was for a lot of my life of I really care about the reality, there are a lot of points where I missed it myself. No one likes to talk about this stuff because it's messy, right? It doesn't make anyone look good. It doesn't make me look good because it makes me look like I'm going to air everyone's dirty laundry. It doesn't make everyone in the movement or conservatism look good because they look like a mess. They look like it's full of people that are stealing money and lying about each other. <laughs> Which and they are. <laughs> I, I could very easily carry on just making videos. I climb that social ladder, not talk about any of this, and my life would be a lot simpler. But I genuinely can't. I can't. I, it doesn't feel right. I feel like it's dishonest. I feel whenever I talk about the right wing and when people wonder why I have so much distrust or skepticism or Animosity. why I don't like the right or isolate myself a bit more, no one really understands why. <laughs> and I haven't explained any of it because it's just so much. That's so much. And it's just, it's just, it's easier not to talk about. But um, yeah, we're about to get into some heavy stuff here. <laughs> we're about to get into some much heavier stuff. Whew. So 2016, 2017, back to the main storyline. Milo's in hot water over his privilege grant and I am in some hot water of my own. I just don't know it yet. I've moved to Toronto, working for Rebel, killing it. All my videos are doing fantastic. I'm getting these interviews with Jordan Peterson. First one on SJWs, all his protests. They're going viral. At this point, I'm on top of the world. I don't think anything's going to change. It's just upward trajectory with Rebel from here. And then I'm sitting at my desk in the office and I get an email. Uh, it's from Ezra and it says the office are going on an Israel trip. We're going to have some fun, try some couscous, make some Oh my God, she does love Israel, guys. Videos, it'll be great. Okay, so anyways, a few months go by, we're getting closer to the actual trip, and we start getting emails asking us to do public crowdfunding for the trip, and to crowdfund it as a fact-finding investigative journalism mission. No worries. The only problem I had was that when I was speaking to people in the office about the trip and getting itineraries for it, it became pretty obvious that this was a guided tour, not a fact-finding mission. We had, you know, people we were slated to speak to every day. We had a tour guide that was, you know, aligned with um, an organization that was assisting to fund the trip. And I have no problem whatsoever with guided tours of Israel, people who do these paid for trips to kind of get people to understand the politics and the ideas there. That's not my issue at all. It was that it wasn't being honest with the audience. What we were asked to pitch the audience was that we were going on this like hardcore fact finding mission when really it was just like a tour guide trip that was already being assisted in funding. So I sent an email to the higher ups telling them, listen, like, seems like a great trip, seems like a lot of fun. My particular expertise is not in Middle Eastern issues whatsoever. I don't have a massive opinion on this stuff. Um, and I'm just not comfortable telling the audience that we're going on a fact finding mission that's actually a, a tour. Right? So I want to share some of my concerns about the Israel crowdfunding. Why do these, do you guys use these terms? I feel like, sorry, I see that Lauren for Liberty and it sounds like a conservative, like American email address, but maybe Canadians do this too. The bookcase can't be blocked from view from the table. I don't care, fuck that. Um, so I want to share some concerns about the Israel crowdfunding. It does indeed say in the first email that let's do a lot of fun videos about there. So that's fine. I did, however, assume that such a cost, cost ineffective trip with so many talent being brought along with sponsored. Maybe I was silly to assume that, but it looks like I was partially right anyway. I love being able to do grassroots crowdfunding for stuff like DC. People are happy to help. And although I don't necessarily a or I don't necessarily agree with overfunding for stuff, I get that's how we make money. We're a business and it can be justified in the public eye. I, however, don't see how such a cost ineffective trip with so many talent and so little demand for a story in the area, especially from my Israel Palestine illiterate perspective, can be justified for crowdfunding. I never would have imagined after seeing the initial list of people going that we would have our audience pay for that question mark i don't feel comfortable crowdfunding for this i wouldn't mind putting in a video a general video just saying support the rebel with buying a membership etc that's totally cool just have a lot of trouble morally justifying this one let me know your thoughts if that means i can't go to totally understand if you want to take jerry something instead i get it just don't feel morally right doing this wow cringe 
She should have just <laughs> gotten her bag. Right? So can I fundraise in some other way? Can I maybe just ask people in general for donations to Rebel? Say we need help. Say we need, you know, obviously every, every company needs money to function and run. So can I just portray this in a different way that I feel is more honest to the audience? And maybe I'll even take a step back from the Israel trip. I don't have to go. I just, I'm not a big fan of the structure. Um, I didn't think I had done anything wrong. I thought that was like a very reasonable, well-measured approach to a situation that I was a bit uncomfortable with. But some, for some reason, I still had this sinking gut feeling that there was something bad about to happen. Went home, slept, got to work the next day, setting up my papers in the office, getting ready to write my video, and I get called into the general manager's office. I hadn't done anything wrong. I still hold that I have not done it. I had not done anything wrong. So I didn't think I had reason to be worried. But when they brought me in, I was told that I Wait, hold on. That I was a bit uncomfortable with. Like a very not a big reasonable um, for some reason I still had I fundraise and The only thing I was curious here is if um, if she CC'd like other people in the company, because that would explain why somebody got really mad. It, not, it could be for other reasons too, but I was curious if there was like a CC to like, a, like other people or whatever, but okay, just checking for that. <clears throat> Some other way. Can I be more on? I just, I'm not a big fan of the structure. Um, I didn't think I had done anything wrong. I thought that was like a very reasonable, well-measured approach to a situation that I was a bit uncomfortable with. But some, for some reason, I still had this sinking gut feeling that there was something bad about to happen. Went home, slept, got to work the next day, setting up my papers in the office, getting ready to write my video, and I get called into the general manager's office. I hadn't done anything wrong. I still hold that I have not done it. I had not done anything wrong, so I didn't think I had reason to be worried. But when they brought me in, I was told that I was being let go. I was being fired from the company. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, that, I lost my job in conservative media. And <laughs> I will never forget walking out of that office with my little box of things and sitting on the curb outside thinking to myself, you know what? I did the right thing. I did the right thing. I was honest about how I felt about this. I was honest that it made me feel uncomfortable. And if I got fired for being honest, then so be it. That's why I'm making this video right now, because I'm really bad at being dishonest. Um, but you know, I also had this feeling of impending doom that just sunk in my stomach, realizing how am I going to pay the rent? How am I going to pay my next bill? I live in a one bedroom apartment in Toronto sleeping on a mattress that I can't even afford a bed frame for. Just having this realization that doing the right thing doesn't pay the bills, it's, it's depressing, but true. And it never changes. This video is probably going to severely hurt my career. Severely. There'll probably be a bunch of people that cut me off, maybe people that pursue me legally. <laughs> it's not gonna be good. It's not gonna be good, but I can't. I have sat for so long wanting to make this video it bothers me all the time, every day, when I don't. So I just have to, I don't, I, whatever. Jesus. I just want to be on the record. If there are any conservatives that would seriously consider cutting off Lauren for this type of video, um, my email is contact at Destiny GD. If you offer me enough money, I'll join you, okay? But <laughs> I need a big payment. If you're not willing to offer five figures, don't even think about it, okay? But just let me know, okay? So after my whole uh, crying on the curb situation, I say, F it, you know what? I believe in this. 
I believe in doing this right. I'm gonna go independent, do my own thing, not cause any drama, don't need that in my life, just move on. And then um, a few months after going independent myself, I see this video come up on my newsfeed of a couple guys that also got fired from Rebel uh, that had a bunch of problems with them named Kalen and George. And they were working for Tommy Robinson, doing incredible content with him. It's going viral. Tommy's career is killing it. And these videos they're filming are just gorgeous. And I realize they've actually DM'd me before. So we get in touch and we decide we're going to do some work together. I'll come out to London. We'll do some filming. They love what they're doing, but <laughs> things are hectic and chaotic, which let's get into that. Uh, I fly out to London and Tommy, Kaylin, and George are, they, they are hard to explain. So publicly, the whole drama with Rebel Media, allegedly Kaylin and George were blackmailing Tommy Robinson. That was what the public story was. And that's why they were fired from Rebel, and that's why there was all this drama. I've had a rough week. No, it's not what you think. It's not because the liberal media is criticizing us for being too right-wing. That happens all the time. Uh, something else happened to me for the first time in my life, actually, and I don't really know how to say it other than to just say it, and I can't really believe it, but here it goes, I'll say it. I'm being blackmailed. They were threatening Tommy Robinson, too. Kaylin Robertson and George Llewellyn John threatened to release video footage they claimed to have taken of Tommy Robinson confessing that he punched a guy at Ascot in self-defense. When I went to London and I met them all, I met them all at a bar together as they were laughing and acting like best friends. It was another one of those situations where I just walk in and I'm like, I is anything these people in politics say publicly true? Is any of it true? Why are the three of you here laughing and having beers together when everyone on Twitter is talking about how you've all betrayed each other and are having this- Oh, it's like my dream of going to the bar and seeing all the people hanging out with each other. And I'm like, wait, I thought you guys all hated each other. And they're like, no, that's fake. <laughs> true. It's massive fallout. Like the dream. Actually true. Except it's real life. I knew it. But they basically said, yeah, none of that was true. We're good mates. That's just rebel drama. We're fine. We're all working together. Come join us in the UK. Have some fun. So I stay in the UK for a while. We film a bunch of videos. I watch their process filming content with Tommy. At this point in time, they are secretly filming for Tommy. So the public don't know since they're supposed to be in public drama. And this seemed to be a, a repetitive cycle. Actually, you know what? Let me pause for a minute here and explain this. This is really important. Kaylin, Tommy, and George were like a toxic relationship. They would fight all the time. They'd have problems and break up. But they also kind of needed each other. Like they worked really well together, but they were just constantly having these makeup, breakup, makeup, breakup sessions. But the issue was both of them would make mistakes. Tommy would go out on a bender, get drunk and fall asleep under a bridge somewhere and d not show up to a shoot that they were supposed to do and forget to pay them. Kaylin and George would get pissed and decide to use his credit card to pay dinner for themselves since they didn't get paid for a whole day of work they were supposed to get paid for and took the day off for. And they'd have all of these constant falling outs that were absolutely 1000% both of their faults. But because Tommy was the public figure and because it was him that the public looked to and gave donations to and he was kind of you know the the face of the operation whenever falling outs would happen all of the blame publicly had to go on Kaylin and George of course they're the support staff if Tommy's reputation is wrecked well then none of them have jobs anymore so Tommy would apologize in private all the time for dumb shit that he did for forgetting to pay them for not showing up for things he would apologize all the time in private but no one publicly ever saw those apologies so it looked like everything that ever went wrong in the relationship between Tommy Kalen and George was always Kalen and George's fault it was another one of these million situations that I witnessed over and over and over again where support staff would just absolutely have their reputations destroyed by famous people basically needing to protect their reputations because that's their whole job. So Kaylin and George, I know a lot of people watching this are going to be like, are you talking about those Antifa traitors? Are you talking about those scum that scammed Tommy Robinson? <laughs> oh, my friend. I'm sorry, but you have heard a lot of stories that are just not even remotely close to true. 
Um, and half of it started with this beginning constant breakup makeup cycle and apologies only happening one way publicly towards Tommy. So that's, that's kind of explaining the grounding that I'm walking into in London and what I'm witnessing. It's all chaos. Everything people see publicly isn't quite the truth. And these people work amazing together, but it's, it's a toxic relationship, plain and simple. So at this point, I'm doing a ton of work with Kaylin and George. They're filming these hilarious, like just gorgeous videos for me, uh, like uh, how to be a single woman. It was so funny. We had so much fun filming it, but then they're also working for Tommy. So Tommy's coming by every other day saying, hey, let's go out and do this shoot and that shoot. Half of it is public with Kaylin and George. Half of it is private and secretive. They're always in some drama, but um, eventually I get invited to speak at Day for Freedom in the UK. This was right after I got banned. Oh, there's a lot that happened between there, but that's for a whole nother video on its own. And I want to get into this story because it, once again, I really want to talk about all the people that were burned throughout this process and all the people that were burned over money, reputation, this kind of stuff. It's, it's really important to highlight just how messed up the culture was in this political movement. Lucy Brown. Lucy Brown. Lucy Brown was another support staff for Tommy. So there were like three people that were basically making Tommy's career possible. And you'll notice that you probably don't see much of Tommy Robinson on your feed anymore. And you can jump up and down and blame censorship. But the reality is a lot of people need their support staff to be successful. And when you burn them, <laughs> hard to keep going. Uh, and the people were thanking me. I had loads of people coming up saying thank you for the day. I didn't do anything. That's the truth. They done it all. So it was Lucy Brown, Kaylin, and George. They were running the websites. They were doing all the editing. They were doing all the graphics. They were organizing all the events. They were pulling Tommy and whoever else out of bars, half drunk. She's been seat hoiling her way around Birmingham. And somehow she thinks it's all sort of cute. To get them to bed, to sleep, and then driving them places in the morning. It was crazy how much the three of these people did. You're wearing real fur. I think that's fucking outrageous. That is disgusting. How was that steak you ate yesterday? Yeah, but JFK was murdered. Steak? You're not comparing the steak to fur? I'm wearing it, you're eating it. <laughs> Lucy, this is a boardroom. What do you think you're doing? Just What's this? this? This presentation. Oh. Lucy! <laughs> <laughs> That's not a fun. <laughs> but Lucy was one of the main point persons for organizing Day for Freedom. God, the fucking tape, fucking every time people do this shit, it's the worst thing in the world. <laughs> Today has been called the day for freedom. These people feel like they are losing their voice in society. However, is that really the case when they're amongst some of the most famous, followed and talked about activists in the country? The event was organised by former EDL leader Tommy Robinson, who thinks that the government, the media and social media companies are trying to censor his views. A lot of you will remember this if you were around in that time. Huge event in London. Milo spoke there, Gavin spoke there. I spoke there on a billboard right after my ban. And one of the angles that Tommy and Lucy and everyone thought would be fun to take was this isn't just like a free speech event for right-wingers. We support free speech in general for everyone. We're gonna have a, you know, 
drag queen come and sing there. We're going to have a Muslim speaker come there. Obviously, Tommy's whole approach to things was criticizing Islam. So the idea that he would do a free speech event and have a Muslim there would be massive, like really show a commitment to free speech. So it's 8.30 and we needed somewhere to film in Manchester. And we were meeting Janaya and Bill Phil for our promo video. So I contacted my mate Mark. And we've intruded, invaded, and we've drunk all his dad's beer. <laughs> we've just finished, we left at six this morning. We're about to go head back down to Luton now. We've got a busy day tomorrow, but this promo, it will be worth it. It's about showing how many people this is affecting, all the different communities and everyone that's affected. So yeah, peace and uh, get gear out. <laughs> uh, Tommy actually did a public announcement saying we're going to have Ali Dawa, one of Tommy's arch nemesis, come and speak on stage. He did this announcement on Facebook and he told Lucy, invite Ali Dawa, make a poster for him, bring him to the event. Will Ali, Ali Dawa be speaking? Yes, Ali Dawa will be speaking. He's our surprise idiot of the day guest but as soon as tommy posted that facebook video he got incensed reactions from his audience a lot of football lads a lot of people that felt tommy was betraying his criticisms of islam betraying his ideals by inviting this guy and within less than an hour tommy deleted this facebook video just pretended he never uploaded it gone right uh deleted all of the posts he made about ali dawa coming got rid of them all based the event comes Based the next religious day. intolerance. Ali Dawa shows up for his scheduled speaking time. I think Count Dankula even posted a photo of the speaker's list where it showed Ali Dawa's speaking slot. Oh my God, they've actually got Ali Dawa. It's happening, it's happening. This is fantastic. Tommy's... A bun it's hard to talk about because obviously this is... I, I believe there are so many legitimate concerns about Islam. I think there are so many people in the UK that are conservative, that truly you know, deserve a voice, but there were some, some bad actors there that uh, were Tommy supporters, that when Ali Dawa and Mohammed Hajib, I think was his friend, when they showed up to give their speech, they got beat up. They got beat up and dragged out of the Day for Freedom event. Not a good look for a free speech event. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Hey, hey, hey. What's struggling with? The weather or? I thought conservatives dropped the Islam thing. Does Ella still do that meme a lot? Um, I don't know if she's talked about it much recently. Um, <clears throat> Anti-Islam sentiment, sentiment, I think, across Europe um, was probably peaked or became a huge hot-button topic post-2013 uh, Ref refugees from Syrian like exodus like that the Syrian refugee crisis I think is what one of the huge events that spurred on a lot of the kind of like anti-islam sentiment and then kind of furthered a lot of the right-wing parties that grew especially I think in France with Marie Le Pen and I think Germany with the AFD um, Sweden had their own problems taking on um, shit but like 2013 2014 I think was a big driver of that I would argue that probably one of the biggest contributing factors to brexit um, there were, um, yeah, that, that was just that, that, that the Syrian refugee thing was a really, really, really big deal <clears throat> in terms of pushing a lot of the, uh, the anti-Islam rhetoric. And then ISIS as well, obviously didn't help with the terrorist attacks and everything too. But I think with the, um, I think with the Syrian refugee crisis, that's where you were getting the big videos and shit. Um, with, I think even people, I think even people like Lauren saying things like, look at all the, what was the term she used? The fighting age men that are coming to these other countries that aren't real refugees and shit. Like, that was a big, big, big thing, yeah. In her video, a current take section, she just did her big signal about having an issue with Islam, which is why I asked. Oh, I, yeah, I don't know. I haven't watched that video. But... Part of the Brexit propaganda was Turkey could join the EU, Syria could be next. Sure, maybe. I don't know. I was invited today. No, 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 no. Because I want to speak about freedom of speech. No, 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 no. Do you want to speak? Yes. No, you don't. Do you, when, when do you have a chance to have our say? We have our say. We have our say. We have our say. We have our say. We Jesus Christ, 
The free speech event that's supposed to be for conservatives, you know, supporting the free marketplace of ideas. Meanwhile, all of us make fun of Antifa for needing to resort to violence. That event resulted in right wingers beating up Muslims for wanting to speak freely. Everyone becomes a hypocrite, hey? But uh, that actually wasn't the, that, that was a terrible, terrible part of that event, horrible part of that event. But that actually wasn't one of the worst things that, that happened. After Ali Dawa got beat up. I think I mentioned, um, I think I've mentioned this before. I think at the, at the early point of my life, I think the most um, disillusioned I'd become with conservatives were, because I would say in high school, I was like a conservative slash libertarian. I think a lot of younger people would have been. You're kind of like a conservative slash libertarian because in, in some ways, a lot of them were conflated. But it was um, like my mom, obviously, Cuban immigrant, was in the Air Force, told, tells me all these great things about America, freedoms, anybody can do them, blah, 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 blah. Um, and you'd always heard like, there are so many ubiquitous phrases among right-leaning people. Uh, <clears throat> I might disagree with what you say, but I'll die for your right to say it, right? I'd heard that type of shit a lot. And you know, conservatives were way better than liberals at protecting free speech who wanted to censor everything. Even back then when I was in high school, that was like the, that was the take. But it was after the 9-11 attacks when conservatives and people in New York were starting to protest like mosques being built. I was like, hold on. This is the United States of America. You can't tell somebody not to build something because you don't like their religion. That's fucking wild. I remember that was like one of the first like huge moments for me as a kid where I was like, this is not, I don't think this is living up to the American ideal very much um, because there were huge, every time like somebody wanted to put up a new mosque or something in New York, people were like, this is only two miles from ground zero. This is ridiculous, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, holy shit, that, that's um, a little bit, not a little bit, not very American chief. What, ha what happened to the whole, uh, uh, you know, die for your right to say it and everything? I guess, I guess not. I think Trump was one of those people at that time that was saying, um, I remember the stories of like, I heard two different flavors of the same story. I don't know what ended up being the more popular, but one was that when the towers came down, there were groups of Jewish people dancing. I feel like that was a later one made up by alt writers, but the more popular one at the time was, I thought it was when the towers came down, there were a group of uh, Muslims that were dancing. That was the, uh, the one that I'd heard said so much, like, look, these Muslims in the United States were celebrating the fall of the Twin Towers. Um, I've heard that take given, repeated by alt writers a while ago, where they say it was Jewish people instead. But yeah, I remember at that at the time, there was a very, very, very high uh, anti-Islam sentiment in the United States. So I was like, it's a little bit crazy, but okay. Up and dragged out of the event. Um, Maybe it was Hassan dancing. A lot of people publicly wanted an explanation. Why did Ali Dawa show up, Tommy? Why did he think he was going to get this, this free area to speak his horrendous ideas in front of a crowd? And Tommy publicly said, I'd be happy if my freedom and right to freedom of speech, where I was invited today, would happen today. If it doesn't, you know what well, that means? You're on the menu. He clearly said Ali Dawa was not invited to speak. Three posts saying he's categorically not invited to speak. Now, those posts were removed from my Facebook. I didn't remove them. An admin removed them. Why? I don't know. Was there any validity to the dancing claims that were just made up? On the day of, I think it was made up. Then somebody, I think, tried to say like there was a year anniversary where it happened. And I think there were like some people dancing or photographed somewhere, but it was at like a New Year's party like a few months later or so. I don't remember. The, but the, the original claim, if you've never heard the original claim before, it was basically that like either a group of Jewish people or a group of Muslims was dancing because they were either celebrating death to America or they were celebrating that their like secret plans to like bring down the towers worked or whatever. There's like, there's 50 million different flavors of that conspiracy theory. Removed. Just completely lied. Completely lied. I don't even dislike Tommy. I just dislike the fact that he did this stuff. And this is where I absolutely have to call out Tommy Robinson for posting completely fake news to his Facebook profile. In a video Tommy Robinson posted the other day, it says in the beginning, Muhammad Hijab assaults police. The description of the video says, Muslim MMA fighter turns up to provoke trouble at the Day of Freedom and his film crew live stream him hitting a police officer. Hashtag own goal. That is completely disingenuous. He came out and publicly said, I would never invite Ali Dawa. Never in a million years. 
I would never invite that moron to come speak at my event. Lucy, you're lying. Lucy, you're lying. Lucy, stop. What do you mean Everything I'm lying? Said lying? You said to me to delete the tweet because you wanted to introduce him. Go on, off you go, you fucking coward. I wish I had like the I wish I had the audacity to do something that's probably no, I didn't say that. <laughs> no. What, what what? No. No, I didn't. That's a good meme. In fact, not only did I not invite him, he was secretly invited behind my back by Lucy Brown, who is this horrible left-wing Antifa spy that is trying to destroy our movement. Base. Oh, where have we heard this story before, am I right? Um and he pinned all the blame for this on Lucy. If you haven't figured this out, we kind of got this with Nick's uh, America First shit imploding a little bit recently. On the left, everybody is like a secret Nazi or fascist. On the right, everybody's a secret Antifa or FBI informant. Um. Said she did it behind his back, was secretly working against him. Oh. It makes you question how long, how long herself or others have been- Undermining the movement. Conspiring or working together. We'll soon see anyway, won't we? But, um, yeah, every, I should have took the warnings. Everyone tried to warn me. Everyone warned me. And what came of this was just horrendous. Lucy randomly just started seeing all of these tweets all over her timeline, all over Facebook, saying she was a disgusting whore, a snake, that she had betrayed the movement, how dare she, and, and just started panicking. I've talked to her about this a thousand times, but, it wasn't until three days later that she found out that Tommy had also fired her from her job. She'd given up everything. <laughs> she was quite a successful photographer. Base she secret had firing. Really good opportunity. In her she sleep. Was a young, beautiful girl I'm with sorry, that's not funny. a whole future ahead of her, and she had thrown it all away to work for Tommy because she believed in what he was doing, just to be fired out of nowhere so that Tommy could keep up public appearances. That, of course, I didn't invite Ali Dawa. Lucy was a secret snake that did all of this. And he obviously, to back that up, he couldn't just keep her employed. That would look crazy. People would be like, why are you still employing this woman who's a snake who went behind your back? So he fired her. He fired her to keep up the public appearance of this lie he told. That video of him saying he invited Ali Dawa exists, it's out there. But no one bothered to look for it. They just completely believed, once again, what their idol at the front of the movement, it's Tommy Robinson, how could he do any wrong? They just believed him and took a stand against Lucy. Um, Lucy's life was destroyed. There's no other way of putting it. Absolutely destroyed. She had to go on to government assistance. She had a massive mental health collapse after all of this stuff that she sacrificed her life for. Everyone turned against her. Um, she had to move back in with her parents, got extremely ill. Go That's what's gonna happen to Lanny after Xander Hall. Fucks her life up, guys. Don't let it happen. Hashtag save Lanny. Going to counseling. Uh, almost killed herself. She she did nothing wrong. She did nothing wrong. Um, and she kept trying to tell the truth and just say, no, like we should have let him speak. That was the plan from the beginning and no one believed her. They all took a stand against her. <laughs> there are absolutely no rewards for people who stick to their values in this industry. No rewards. And these are people that are supposedly concerned about young white girls being groomed and raped and they're yeah. speaking to you in this way. Yes, as a result of, you know, standing up and saying, I'm not necessarily, I don't necessarily agree with this or, you know, I'm going to go my own way. Um, I'm now, yeah, sort of li living in a kind of situation where I'm, I'm sort of scared for my safety. Uh, this is something I really want to touch on because it's something I have seen repeat itself so many times. But after Lucy's massive mental health collapse, her life being destroyed by all of this. She still has stalkers to this day that threatened to kill her. She has people yell at her in the streets over her being the traitor to Tommy Robinson. All completely false. Of course, when left-wing journalists came to her and said, we care about you. We care about your side of the story. They We're just not want the story. That way. Having someone say that to her, of course she'd want to go speak to them and have someone who actually wants to hear her side, which perpetuates the lie. People see her now, go speak to left-wing journalists, and they say, see, we called her a snake. We said she was a snake, we called it, right? When in reality, she was driven to speak to them by a bunch of people on the right being horrible to her. Would you say, okay. he's, would you say he's, he's far right then? People. Like him or loathe him, he speaks on behalf of them. It's not about him in a way, it's about the people who he represents, and there's a heck of a lot of them, and they feel left behind. Yeah, and it's like a self-confirming 
prophecy, self-confirming prophecy. But eventually Lucy realized all the left-wingers that wanted to speak to her as well, just wanted to use her for political reasons and then discard her. And she's been having a really hard time. I, I, a really hard time since all of that. A lot of these people that I kind of look back on as the casualties of this political movement I got swept up in, I still keep in touch with them. I still talk to them and ask them how they're doing every once in a while. And I, I care. A lot of people that were in my position, they're just the casualties. They're gone. But I, I really care what happened to a lot of these people. Um, so I, I've still talked to Lucy every once in a while. And I spoke to her recently, especially letting her know I was going to film this. I asked, looking back on it, what, what do you think of these people, like Tommy that did this to you? What do you think of, obviously I had my own experiences with this. What do, you, what do you think of these people that just throw you under the bus for sticking to your values? And she wrote something that, oh, it's like a dagger to my heart when I read it. But she said, personally, I think we stand as a mirror to their failings because they either gave up on their morals long ago or never had any in the first place and are surprised when someone with nothing to gain still stands up for what they think is right. Exactly what they claim to do to their poor audiences. And, you know, when she talks about that mirror, how Lucy's sticking to her values and saying, no, you know what? You may try to ruin my life, but it was the right thing to say, we should have Ali Dawa speak at this conference. It was the right thing. That's our true dedication to free speech. And I'm not gonna lie about it. All I could think is when, when people see that mirror that makes them look into how hypocritical they're being, all they want to do is smash that mirror. All they want to do is destroy people like Lucy who make them, who make them look at their own shortcomings. And God, it makes me see, ah, yeah. Yeah, it's, had to watch it one too many times happen to far too many people that I care about. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna take a break. Hmm. Okay, food break. Give me three minutes, one sec. It's interesting to see, and I know you said it a lot, but it's cool to see how truly principled and how much Ella sticks to her values, or at least appears to in this video, like dropping out of a free vacation because she doesn't believe in it and getting fired for it. Big difference for most lefties. I don't think it's like a political thing. Like, I don't think that like conservatives are more likely or lefties are more likely. I think it just comes down to like an individual person. I think that most people that are in the political arena, whether you're on the left or right, I think most people are here to just kind of like, it's like, uh, it's like, it's like entertainment kind of. Um, and the people in this space are actors. Um, so you, you're, you're, you're here to like put on a show, get paid, do your thing. And then whatever your certain like political side is, it's, it's more or less just kind of a, um, it's like the role that you're playing basically. Um, I mean, like you can see in terms of like my interaction with, uh, like a lot of people on the left, I, like I say this a lot, um, but like. I, I truly do feel like people, people like Kethels or Bad Bunny or Hassan, like in another world, um, with like one or two different tweaks in their life, like these would be people like spamming the N word at people in COD lobbies and shit. Um, they just happen to fall on the other side. Like anytime somebody gets so eager to use like a slur or like cracker or gusano, they like get like eager, like giddy to defend it. And then they start to wheel out all the most dog shit defenses that we've heard people say for like, you know, the N word or for any other slur. Like it's pretty obvious that like in another world, you were so close to being that person. You just, but you found like a different way, like a different conduit through which to uh, channel your feelings. But um, let me go warm some food up real quick. Hold on. Um, somebody donated $10. I'm not really reading super chats until we get to the end of this, but I, um, I don't know. I think I actually disagree. I think a lot of these people are a bunch of bullied losers who wish they could torture their bullies and they try to find that opportunity every day. Um, maybe, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Do you have this vision while driving at night? Um, sometimes, not this extreme, but I think if you have these problems, I think it's a sign of an astigmatism, which I have slightly in one of my eyes. Uh, people get really mad when I say like, oh, I have like some respect for like people like Fuentes or Lord or whatever. Um, I think it's not so much, it has nothing to do with their political views. I just, I have respect for people that like genuinely have like some principled political beliefs that they actually believe in. Because when I look at like, when I look at how a lot of people act online, 
I've said this like a million times. It feels like a lot of these people don't really have any beliefs. It's just like whatever the trendy shit is at the time that gets them the most clicks and views. And the way that I see this the most is it's very, very, very rare that I have a conversation with any of these big people where it feels like they really understand what they're talking about and then they can like provide like a challenging perspective or conversation. Like most of them avoid conversation like the devil because they know they can't provide any interesting or challenging perspectives. A lot of people don't understand anything they're talking about. So then a lot of the outrage and feelings they have just feel like very performative to me. Um, so like when Lance gets like really indignant about it, Google wouldn't even let these poor trans people have their names on their badges. They just he, they wanted to dead name them constantly, and but he didn't he didn't know anything about the story. He didn't know if it was actually Google. It was just a security subcontractor. He didn't know the reason why. He hadn't thought about it. It's like how can you be so mad? How can you be so mad about this story but you don't even know anything about it? Like it sounds like this is all like just performative bullshit. I don't like it doesn't seem like you care about this at all. Like I don't know that kind of stuff drives me fucking crazy. Any people on the left that you respect? Um, in terms of large content creators, I don't think so. Um, maybe I like AOC seems like somebody genuinely, but she's like a politician, not a content creator. Um, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. I'm sure there must be some. There must be some people out there. Hutch, I wouldn't consider Hutch like a political guy. Hutch seems genuine though. Um, Abba and Preach, yeah, but I mean, they're not like political commentators. Um, yeah, I don't know. Farmlands. I'm in South Africa to find truth. Truth. In a country where farming is one of the most dangerous jobs on earth. Some Your music! So loud! When I went independent, one of the main things I wanted to do was just real on the ground journalism. Like real stories, real people. I was getting so sick. So sick of the drama behind the scenes. So sick of the talking points every day in front of the camera with the teleprompter, right? And I just wanted to cover something real. And I kept seeing on Twitter, all these people talking about a white genocide going on, children being tortured and murdered, whole families being executed and the government covering it up. And this just seemed like, why is no one talking about this issue? You have mainstream media companies with millions of dollars in budget that are not covering this at all. I'm not seeing it anywhere. So I spoke to Kaylin and George, didn't have much money at the time, but we had enough for flights there and back. And we were like, let's just do it. Let's go take this crazy chance see what's going on on the ground and tell the story. Um, so we booked those tickets, getting ready to go. And I remembered an old promise I had. Some of you will recall Faith Goldie. We worked together at Rebel Media. We had a great relationship, super close friends. She was like my mentor for everything. Mainstream politics helped me buy dresses, told me how to fashion myself. I taught her about inter internet culture and memes and we just got along well. But when I left, Rebel, we didn't, we didn't talk that much. We only talked uh, one time in person before Farmlands was filmed. I remember telling her about my idea of wanting to go to South Africa and we had made a pinky promise that if I went and did a report like this, we would do it together. She would come with me and she really wanted to. And right before we left on the trip, I, I just remember that coming to the back of my mind and being like, I promised Faith we'd, we'd do something like this together. So I'm gonna call her up and just tell her about the trip, see if she wants to join. It's December, I was back home with my family for Christmas and I called her that night and she answered the phone. I told her about the trip, asked her if she wanted to come and she just flew into a rage. It was the strangest thing. I was like, Faith, I'm inviting you on this trip to come with us. Like, if, if you don't wanna come, that's fine, but I'm just putting it out there. And she said, no, Lauren, like I am infuriated with you. You have betrayed me because you planned this trip behind my back. And I've got my own trip to South Africa planned the next month after you. And you going to South Africa will ruin my trip. It, it really confused me at the time because first of all, I thought the only thing that mattered about this was that we were going to tell this important story. We were going to tell the story of people that were being horrendously Chill. harmed, discriminated against, tortured and killed. And that was what mattered here, not who got to the story first or what the timeline was for who was telling it. And Those more people so, are, <laughs> that's cool, late guys, okay? They were in a bad cult. We were both planning trips and I was <laughs> the only one who held to our pinky promise to invite the others. So what, I, I didn't understand what the 
I just really didn't understand what right she had to be angry in that situation. But she was, she was infuriated. So I tried to calm her down. This was a horrible trait I had. I was such a pushover with people that I was friends with in media, especially conservative media. Definitely not with the left or in public, but with my conservative friends, I was such a pushover. I just wanted to keep them, keep them friends with me. I really respected them. I thought so highly of this movement I was a part of. I didn't want them to hate me. So I always tried to smooth things over, which caused probably more problems than it solved. But I, I told Faith, I'm like, screw it. Let's just do it together. You can come on my trip. We'll figure it out. It'll be fine. And Faith eventually agreed. She said, all right, Lauren, we'll do the trip together. It's fine. We're okay. Three days passed. I kept contacting her, sent her text messages, called her, sent her Twitter DMs saying, hey, I'm booking flights. Are you coming? Are you coming? And she had disappeared off the map. She wasn't responding to anything I sent. And then three or four days later, she released a video on her YouTube channel titled Faith Goldie's Exclusive Trip to South Africa. All alone, just Faith. I'm going by myself. I'm going to go uncover the Based. truth. All of the things I had told her about that I was going to do in my documentary with her. She just published as her own little exclusive thing. I called her up and I said, hey, I thought we were doing this together. What's going on? And she said, no, Lauren, I'm doing it by myself. I'm getting the story. And if you tell anyone you're going as well, I'll say you stole the trip from me. What? Like what, this whole idea of stealing an idea from someone else from a story that needs to be covered by as many people as possible didn't make any sense to me, first of all. I wouldn't care if we both went on the trip, if she went first, if I went after, it didn't matter. It wasn't about the exclusive. It was about getting eyes on this extremely important subject. But to her, it was about making sure it was Faith Goldie's expose, not just an expose of the truth, but that it was Faith Goldie that got the story. And that was another one of those moments of meeting my heroes and wondering, do you actually care about any of this? Do you care about any of this? Do you care about people seeing it? Or do you care about people knowing you're the one that got the story? And that was really another one of those, oh, this is, there's so much. <laughs> what do we have to do to fuck over Lauren to be in her next manifesto, guys? There's gotta be something. Brokenness in this political movement, so much brokenness. Uh, it really hurt. It really hurt to lose a friendship over something like that. <clears throat> it breaks my heart that you felt betrayed. I'm so sorry for even having the conversation by going alone. I hope you understand. I've wanted to do this with you since day one discussing it. I'm praying that you can forgive me for even contemplating the idea. Let me know when you're free to talk with me and the lads. We can include Matt as well. Let's create something amazing together. God bless. <coughs> Damn, what a cuck. What a pushover. especially one that I, I thought was a, was a close friendship. But I said, I, I almost considered canceling the whole trip genuinely because I was so upset about the whole friendship thing and Faith hating me. But eventually I went back to Kaylin and George. We talked it over and we're like, no, like this is an important story. We need to tell it. Faith can do hers. Wish her all the success in the world. I hope as many people cover this as possible. Let's just do it. Who cares if people say we stole the trip? It doesn't matter. What matters is that it's being covered. But we fly out there land, waste absolutely no time, get in the car, we're sleeping on people's couches to make it work, saving pennies where we can, every single day, 24 hours working, collecting these people's stories, just they're, they're pouring their souls out to us, sobbing about family members that have died, we're speaking to politicians that are calling for the murder of an entire people group in this country, and no one is covering the story at this point, and we are blown away by what we are finding on the ground. Those of you who have seen Farmlands, obviously, you know, you know. And of course, uh, as soon as we published our first video on the ground in South Africa, all the little people on Twitter started tweeting out, Lauren stole this video, this was Faith's idea, this, that, and the other. But I'm, I'm thankful that at the time, it was so just such noise to us when we were there in person, actually doing the work, right? So I didn't care that much until we were talking to one of the farmers who out of nowhere asked us, do you know who Faith Goldie is? I'm, I'm pretty sure I've seen you guys in videos together. She's supposed to be coming out here 
in a few weeks and filming with us and we haven't gotten contact from her. Do you think you could get in contact with Faith for us, Lauren? We've got this huge drill planned. We've invited all of these different farmers. They've taken time off work. They've spent all this money to make this happen. And we really want this story to be told by as many people as possible. Do you know Faith Goldie? She's not responding anymore. She's ghosted us. And I, I told them, I'm like, I, I think she's coming. I hope she's coming. I don't really know. When I got home and eventually they got to doing that drill, Faith never showed up. She never showed up. All of these farmers took their time off to tell their story to her and she didn't go because she couldn't have the exclusive. She made up some bullshit reason on Twitter saying I couldn't go because my security was comp. <laughs> Following months of planning a personal loan and countless hours in conversation with people all over the globe due to outside interference and ultimately a failure of guaranteed security on the ground, it sounds me to announce I will not be traveling to South Africa this month. Damn. Compromised and then told her cameraman, a guy named Millennial Matt, to publicly tweet out that the security was compromised by me and my team that Kaylin George and I had stolen her security, trying to get her killed in South Africa so she wouldn't be able to film her trip. And that's why she couldn't go to the country and do the documentary she planned on doing. Obviously, none of this was true. We didn't have security. We couldn't have afforded security if we wanted it. Not only that, we were purposely trying to help her. We left out things that we didn't film for farmlands because people told us, oh, we want to show that to Faith. And we thought she should have some exclusives too. We want her project to do well as well. But she decided to cancel the whole trip, lie about why it was canceled, because she could not have the exclusive. Uh, gatekeep, gaslight, girl boss. <laughs> True. I sit there and I watch these people on social media talk all day about, I want to help my people, I want to save the West, these farmers, I truly care about them deeply. And as soon as it gets down to brass tacks of, oh, you might have to share the story, that's too much. That's too much. The only people who lost out in this were the farmers on the ground who didn't get their story told as much, who showed up and took weeks off work to go and help Faith, who ghosted them. Those are the only people who lose out on this. Who cares if there's kids being boiled in a bathtub if Faith Goldie can't have the exclusive and get the numbers for getting it first. Like, it made me so angry and it still makes me so angry to this day that that was what was so important to people. That was what was so important to way too many people that I worked with. And publicly, you know, for their audiences, they make up all these lies and reasons of why, painful, really painful. Um, and getting back and obviously seeing on Twitter repeatedly, specifically Faith's cameraman, tweet and tweet and tweet saying, Lauren is a fraud, she's lying, she tried to get us killed, because Matt was genuinely upset too, her cameraman. He genuinely believed they were going to go help these white farmers. And the only reason they couldn't do that was because I, I had tried to sabotage their whole trip. And it wasn't until many hours of conversation with her cameraman and, and sending him all the information that he realized, oh, Faith is lying to me. Thank you for not just blocking me and trying to get my side. I do appreciate it. This is all honestly news to me and it has me question a lot of what I've been told by Faith, including weird personal information about you that I am not sure is even true. I'll delete the South Africa tweets, Lauren. I was misled. Thank you, Matt. I really do appreciate it. I'm still trying to reach out to Faith to figure out what's going on because this is super out of character for her. For her, And I'm glad at the very least this nonsense can be cleared out. This is why you got to take the D approach, okay? When people start doing weird fucky shit, you just don't trust them ever. <laughs> there is no seeking clarification or I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I know what they're doing. They're doing some weird, selfish, fucky shit. Thank you for saving through all this BS with me. I was told a heap of rubbish and I feel silly for ever believing in this first place. I really apologize. Any drama my tweets may have caused. I was missing. I think you deserved it. Um, <clears throat> also, wait, what the fuck? What's going on, guys? Is the USD just getting way too strong or is the euro losing a lot of value? That's pretty fucking wild. Not good, guys. I don't see how anyone can be friends with YouTube drama slash news channels. I mean, don't you have to trust your friends? Yeah, I wouldn't. I don't trust any of these motherfuckers, okay? These guys are all wild. Check the pound. Jeez, yikes.
This had nothing to do about security being stolen. This had nothing to do with money being stolen or whatever. This this was entirely just her not wanting to go for clout reasons. And Matt actually apologized to me eventually, which was really nice. But still to this day, I'll meet people that were like mutuals in politics with Faith and I. And this is something that happens so often is people would poison everyone in the political movement against you. They'd say, oh, I don't know if I want to work with you, Lauren. Faith Goldie told me you stole her security and trip. No facts, nothing. She'd just say that to everyone she spoke to. And I had so many people poisoned against me over that. And uh, it takes a long time to undo that. You know, it's easy to roll out a mat of lies. Uh, rolling it back up is, is much harder. And again, this isn't about me. This isn't about the drama I went through in the background. This is about the fact that there are farmers in South Africa that did not get their story told, that took time off work, life, to be there, to show up, that were ghosted because of the nonsense that went on behind the scenes in this conservative movement. Because, or right wing, whatever that we called it at the time, I don't even know. But because of the selfishness, the fact that so much of this 2016 alternative right, dissident right movement was so coded in selfishness, narcissism, cult of personality, and none of it was about helping people. It was about how will latching on to this person's struggle potentially boost my career? How will latching on to these, the deaths of these people boost my career? I'm not talking about the people who watch these videos. I'm not talking about the people covered in these videos. I'm talking about the people at the top. The people, the regular conservatives, you guys, the viewer that followed me from 2016, you're the victim of this all. This isn't the right wing are bad. This isn't my why I left the right video. It is the why I left the right video. Do you think she's gonna cover like pro BLM content now? I'm very conservative still. I just cannot not point out how toxic and sick this was. I can't, because if no one talks about it, then you, you just sweep things under the rug and it continues going on toxic and sick. And you have all of these people that rely on their favorite figures that they've given so much money and influence to, to help them. And they wonder why we're never moving forward. Why, why is nothing changing? Well, a lot of that money, influence, power, and faith people are putting in people is getting squandered away, squandered away due to ego. And if we can't recognize that, then no one, if, if no one's honest about what the problems are, we have no shot of ever fixing them. So we get home, edit Farmlands, which is a massive project, release it, and it is huge. So many eyes on this issue. People were just enthralled with what we discovered in South Africa emotional, heartbroken. It's getting reported on everywhere. Everyone starts talking about this issue. Millions of views. Tucker Carlson, Donald Trump tweets about white farmers in South Africa. The Australian government come out and say they're considering taking them in as refugees. I was seeing it every day on my timeline, every day on my timeline. People like, this is real, this is happening. It's not just rumors anymore. And I remember sitting there thinking, all I wanna do is talk about this more. I wanna take it on tour, show as many people this documentary as possible. And I get an email from a tour company in all places, Australia, who really seem to care about this issue since their company in all places, Australia, who really seem to I care guess. about this issue since their government are potentially gonna pass policies to help these farmers. Of course, of course I said yes, especially after the tour company told me they had worked with Milo, they had worked with uh, Jordan Peterson, all of these people, and they said, you can bring anyone you want with you. We'll get you in every major... <clears throat> Have you ever looked at the South African farmer stuff? Um, I did for a period of time. Uh, there's, it seems like there's like a lot of stuff um, relating to that. It's like very hard to sift through unless you're willing to like dig through a lot of uh, like a lot of stories. Um, uh, so some people would say that a lot of the crimes that were being committed had been pushed under the rug. 
Um, it seemed like there was some truth to that a little bit where people were unwilling to talk about it. But then it seemed like a lot of other people were making the argument that like, yeah, there are definitely problems, but people on the far right wanted to say that every single farmer that got killed was because of like this white genocide overarching narrative. When in reality, um, in South Africa, depending on where you are, there's a lot of crime and a lot of people were killed, but it was because people were just like stealing from them, um, which apparently isn't that uncommon in South Africa in some parts that people will kill you if they can steal your shit. So you were getting this weird thing where it seemed like there were some people that were unwilling to address some of the issues going on, but for the people that were willing to address the issues going on in the far right, they were saying that every single farmer death was like, this is an example of white genocide, white genocide, white genocide, and this is what's gonna start happening in America if we keep pushing this narrative of blah, blah, blah. Um, in terms of which side was more correct, I'm not sure, I had a lot of, um, I had a lot of people emailing a lot of different shit. I, so I don't think I sifted through enough of it to have like a concrete opinion on it. But those were some of the things that um, that I heard basically, yeah. <clears throat> Major city in Australia will screen your documentary in every city. And I remember thinking like, if my film can premiere all over Australia, all over this major country, have it in, you know, massive newspapers, politicians talking about it. Think of the impact that'll have on policy. Think of the impact that will have on these farmers living there. And then I get a text. <laughs> I look at my phone and it's a text from Milo Yiannopoulos of all people saying, Lauren, you need to either join my Australia tour that I'm planning or you need to cancel yours. I'm trying to remember the exact wording. It was something along the lines of, if you go to Australia- Oh, I was gonna say, do you not have the text for this? But she does. Sweetie, I wish you had told me about your Australia plans, <coughs> and especially the dates. We overlap directly, and it is going to kill your ticket sales. Stone dead when I announce, and you're going to resent me, or I have to move all my venue reservations to later dates and lose some deposits. <laughs> my One of my favorite abuse tactics, <laughs> personally, that I like to use, um, is when abusers will always frame things as though they're doing you a favor. Um, not to say that Milo is an abuser here, but like, I shouldn't say abusers, I should say people that are, um, people that are trying to fuck people over, people that are like manipulative or selfish, like people will always try to frame things in ways that it's like, I'm doing you a favor, like I'm just trying to help you here, if you just do this, like it'll be good for you. Um, it's always like really funny, when you can see through it. Elia on tour, my tour is going to wildly outsell yours, and then you're going to be resentful and hate me for it. And I remember looking back and just thinking, what? I don't care. Outsell my tour. It's fine. I'm go going here to premiere my movie. I'm going here to meet people, to give speeches. I don't care if 10 people show up. It'll be great. Like, you do your thing too. That's fine. And it seemed, once again, to him, like all that mattered was the numbers, the competing numbers. Who was going to be bigger? If mine was potentially going to be bigger, then I had to join his or cancel mine altogether. And I just said, Oh, wow. Wait, I wonder if she still thinks that. I don't have the, I guess, I don't have the same background she does, but that. That um that message didn't sound like one of concern for um you know competing numbers and doing better. I think it sounded like he was worried about her cannibalizing any part of his ticket sales. I think that's what he was worried about. That's what it came off as to me. But I could I could be wrong on that. That's just what it reads like. <clears throat> no, no, we can both do it. It'll be fine. Do your tour. I'll do mine. It'll be. Hey, Melissa, I've been abroad. Can you tell? I don't think I can make any promises for another Australia tour in the same year. I appreciate the offer, though. I kind of just need to settle down and stay home for more than a week at a time. Hope it all goes well for you, though. Boom. All right, no worries, sweetie. When are you in Aus? Right. I thought it was great. Didn't really realize the full extent of how not great he was until messages with his tour manager were leaked later on online, in which after I offered, I told him, it's fine, we'll do ours separately. I'll still promote yours, Milo. I'll still do work for you. I'll still tell people to go see yours. And he texted his tour manager saying, Lauren will not be doing a promo interview for my tour. You're just paying to give Lauren Southern access and exposure. Why? She fucked us deliberately doing her tour on the exact dates I told her. Why would you do this? What are you thinking? The answer is no, it's not happening. Fucking ridiculous. This is my tour. That means if we are spending money on original content, it features me, no one else. I'm the star, it's my show, you need to get used to it. I didn't steal his tour dates. I was invited by a company that had set dates, said yes to them before I ever heard from Milo. But more importantly, I remember seeing this and just being, once again, in this position of, 
what the fuck? I joined this political movement because I cared about the issues. I wanted to tell people about them. I wanted as much exposure for them as possible. I truly, truly cared about telling real stories and changing culture. And yet again, I am surrounded by a bunch of people where all they care about is ensuring they are the star of the show, ensuring that they are the only one that gets the exposure, the only one that gets any... I wonder... <laughs> this, is... <laughs> this is super random, but... If technology had been shifted by like 80 years or some shit, <laughs> can you imagine? Like, could you imagine Hitler trying to build the Third Reich and he's got like all these super strong, like I wrote Mein Kampf, I want to kill these people. But you find out that Goebbel is literally just some dude trying to get big on Instagram. He's like, yeah, bro, like, dude, fuck the Jews and all that shit. But like behind the scenes, he's like chilling with Jews. He's like super cool with them. And it's like, it's just some crazy shit he says on social media. Like it would... There's got to be a movie idea in there somewhere. That would be some fucking hilarious shit. It's like Hitler trying to build like the Third Reich, Nazi Germany, but everybody around him is just trying to get like really big on YouTube and they don't actually give that much of a fuck. That slice of the pie. They all just want the biggest slice of the pie and they are willing to kick everyone out, anyone out, no matter how good your work is, no matter how important it is, gone to the curb. Fuck the white farmers. Fuck everyone's stories. If I can't have the exposure, no one can. Doesn't matter, right? Doesn't matter. I'm going to Australia. I'm doing the tour. I've got farmlands to show, people to meet, people to talk to, a lot of fans that are expecting me to show up, get on that plane, land in Brisbane, and I am stoked to start tour day one. I'll never forget day one of that trip, walking into the Brisbane airport, wearing an It's Okay to Be White t-shirt, and it showing up all over the media. Very front provocative. page everywhere in Australia. <laughs> And I just knew this was going to be and why does she have why does she have the provocative shirt? Where is Lauren on my chat? Why would she wear the provocative shirt? <laughs> but then the sunglasses. <laughs> why both? I don't are you trying to be undercover or are you trying to get people pissed? I don't understand. Incredible experience. I was so nervous getting on stage. I had stayed up all night practicing the speech. I remember sitting there with Kaylin and we had an apple and we'd throw it back and forth. I'd do a line and I'd throw him the apple. It was <laughs> hey, I bet she did a line. <laughs> just for helping training. But still, despite all of the practice I did all night, I was shaking before getting on stage. I hadn't done that much public speaking, mostly in front of a camera. Walk up there, look into this crowd. There were 800 people that had showed up. And I remember the, the buses had been attacked by Antifa. The highway was shut down. There were protesters. And we had gotten multiple credible death threats the police had warned us about of people who wanted to come to the show and kill us. So Stefan and I were a bit nervous about that. So Antifa's outside screaming. We've got police surrounding the perimeter, dogs, <laughs> the whole lot. The cavalry of cops just broke them up. Unfortunately, there's a medical conference going on in the other room, and these people leaving the medical conference are being berated and yelled at by these protesters. Are we going around the normal way? Probably the safest way. <laughs> and it did somewhat eventuate. Oh shit, I don't know if this is true, but I heard that in, um... I've heard that in some countries, I think I heard about this in Canada, I don't know if this happened in the US, that like um, certain products would have to label themselves as like, we are not Russian products because like the text or whatever will, will look similar to the, is it Cyrillic? that Russian is written in, and some people would like vandalize or like not buy shit because they thought it was Russian, but it was just fucking, um, <laughs> it would just be some other like Eastern European shit or some other country. Multiple people tried to rush the stage, my first speech down in Australia. But luckily we had these massive security guards. I had my close protection, these big, I think they were Maori guys. They like dragged this social justice warrior off stage, kicking and screaming and howling like she was possessed. And the crowd just went, wild standing ovation cheering hooting laughter it, it was it felt amazing just smiling on that stage and laughing and cracking jokes with with everyone there and a lot of them had just watched farmlands in the other room before the show started we tried farmlands as well we played some but it looks amazing Doesn't on the amazing show starting soon <laughs> and then it went it Ended. I got to sit at a desk and shake everyone's hand. A lot, maybe some of you watching this now were there at the show, shaking my hand, saying hello, taking pictures. I loved that. I loved taking every pictures. minute of I'm it. I loved meeting you guys and showing you my movie. 
So I'm just leaving a show in Perth and this lovely girl named Jocelyn brought me a gift bag and a note and said I saved her from feminism and from being fat and she is literally gorgeous now. Good job Jocelyn, thank you. We went to, oh, it was just day after day, getting on a plane, sleeping for four hours, practicing all night, doing photos, doing media. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. I was exhausted. I had nearly lost my mind by the end of the trip. I have no idea how I'm still awake. The event actually went amazing. Antifa didn't shut it down. They got uh, scared away by police on horses. A few people tried to come on the stage, but they were stopped. The headline of the Australian right now for me is that I'm a dangerous individual. And then below it, it says, woman tries to tackle Lauren on stage. Protesters try to de destroy event. And I'm the dangerous individual. What do you make of this? What did you say? Oh, I said that you're none of those things and that you're just a cunt. <laughs> Most of the signing sessions stayed until 2 a.m. And then we'd get home and have a flight at like 7 a.m. the next day. Kayla. You broke your neck. <laughs> my room. Kaylin, what are you doing in my room? 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 I'm following my daughter. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> so what's the best way to send Oh no. How are you feeling? I am excited and pumped and ready to roll. But it all felt right. It all felt right. I think it was... Sydney that I, I watched a few, I, I walked into the room when people were watching Farmlands and I saw people crying in the crowd. And I, it was that moment that I was like, this, this was all worth it. This was all worth it, this whole trip. That's how I feel like when I make girls cry. <laughs> you know what, it was a long journey, but we got it, I'm just kidding. Oh, and then, after the fourth, the fourth show, the tour organizers were very chaotic and disorganized. It was a mess. Quite frankly, Kaylin pretty much ran the show at that point. We, wa we walked into one, one of the auditoriums and there were no chairs there. And I remember Kaylin turning to the tour organizers and saying, where are all the chairs? And he had to go source them and find chairs for everyone. It was crazy how disorganized these tour organizers organizers were this guy give him, give him a camera this beautiful beautiful man he's one of the main reasons why the show has been a success um and then one morning it was either right after or before the fourth show we get a message from the organizers and they ask us to come down to a meeting room in the hotel we're staying at i bring my mother security i, I brought my mother on tour with me it was very cute <laughs> and Stefan, his wife, we all go down to the meeting room and the tour organizers tell us they ran out of money. It's gone. It's all gone. Base. Nothing. Zero. No money left. The tour made half a million dollars or something like that. I have no idea where the money went. No idea. I don't know how they wasted that much money. Maybe I do. I Wait, did she ever say if she got paid for the did she get paid for that to do that tour? There must have been some. There must have been some payment for it, right? Watch the tour organizer pulling thousands of dollars out of ATM machines, spending tons of money on alcohol, running off. Tons and, of exposure. <laughs> yeah, just being wasted. Well, Kaylin Stefan and I were staying up late making the show happen. My mother was doing tour manager stuff that she never should have been doing. We were basically s scrapping things together at 3 a.m. to make this show happen. And then to find out on that day that all of the money was gone and all of our hard work and sleepless nights, none of it was gonna get paid for. That was a pretty emotional experience, especially because I told my mother that I was gonna pay her for coming along with me. And I didn't want to let anyone down. I told them, okay, what money do we have left here? We need to make sure the security are paid. We need to make sure all the support staff are paid. We need to make sure everyone involved in this is paid. Don't pay me. Stefan agreed. Stand up act of him. Stefan and I both said, don't pay us for any of our speeches. None of it. Just make sure all of the support staff are paid. <laughs> Compared to... <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you remember the time when um, multi-millionaire streamer Hassan was like, you guys are gonna pay me back for the gun range, right? 
couldn't have cost. I don't even think it was ten thousand dollars for that. Um, oh man, that was probably one of the dumbest things I've ever seen on stream in my entire life. That somebody would be so fucking stupid to say that at all, let alone on stream. What a mind-numbingly stupid fucking drama. And for the did it end up being four K? Wait, really? Was it really that cheap? I think I guessed it would have been like six to eight based on everything they were renting. But Jesus Christ, Hassan, what a day. yeah! And then they try to play it off because they all were like they're still desperate, like Hassan Clout simps, and they're all like, oh, it was he was just joking with us. It was a joke. Like they're all being like held hostage by his view count. Jesus. Rest of it, okay. You're out of money. No more money for flights to do the other shows. Well, these people have already paid for their tickets to come see us speak. They've already paid for their tickets for farmlands, all this stuff. We'll pay for it. We'll make it happen. And we did that. We, we paid to make the rest of the show go on and to show up at all these locations and make sure the speech has happened. Somebody just messaged me and said, right now, Hassan is on leftovers bragging about leaving a $100 tip for DoorDash. <laughs> what? Is this true? And like that, I... <laughs> I, I don't say that to be like, oh, look at what a good person I am. I just want you to know this is what matters. Oh, not to right me. now, but apparently you guys he who said bought that tickets recently, to those sorry. shows, farmlands, getting as many people to see that <laughs> as possible. It was not about, oh, am I going to outsell Milo Yiannopoulos and get more money? Am I going to get really crazy numbers on everything? The numbers only matter because I want people to see the story, not because I'm going to make money. I don't understand the backstory. Why is it ridiculous that he asks for his money back? Did he pay for everyone to go to the gun range or something? It's the, well, the funny thing is that like, um, how do I, okay. As a fellow member of the upper middle class or upper class, I don't know where my income puts me at now. If you're going out with a bunch of friends to an event, I feel like it would be a pretty big social faux pas to be making so much money and then to like, at that particular point in time, bring up like, hey, you're gonna pay me back for this, right? Or am I getting paid? Like, if, you're, if you make that much money, like dropping five to $10,000 is not a big deal for an event where you're also streaming and making a fuck, like he probably made that money back in a day, at least, right? <clears throat> How much of this do you actually believe? I mean, Lawrence Manifesto. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm tempted to say, well, why would she get on camera and lie about all of this? But I've seen people, <laughs> Fedmeister, I've seen do dumb, really sh dumb shit in the past. I feel like she could use more um, receipts in this. Like there could be like more text messages or whatever to prove parts of the narrative. Um, she could be lying about things. I mean, I don't know. I would expect her not to. Um, but I mean, I'm always going to be cautious these days because people lie about like insane shit all the time. But um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I would, yeah, I would hope she's not lying about it. But then also, like, when I'm looking at, like, some of the people she's talking about, like, fucking Milo, like, like almost anybody could come to me and say, like, Milo Yiannopoulos is, like, a huge snake. Here's my story. And I probably almost just believe them. Yeah, that's probably pretty reasonable, you know. But by getting this straight, he invited everyone out to the gun range to stream for content <clears throat> and then asked them all to reimburse him for it. Well, not exactly that. I think they all agreed to do a gun stream. And it sounded like he was the one that used his card at the time to, like, secure it or put down the deposit or something. And it wasn't 100% clear who was going to be filming or who was going to be paying for what i guess but he was so he was trying to check check at the end and make sure he was going to get paid back for it it was but it it's just um that just when you're making that much money it just seems like such an inconsequential thing to care about especially when you're making that much money that day streaming it but it was just it seemed like really tactless And I didn't complain about it. Something that needs to understand. Yeah, I don't know how to, I don't know how else to explain it, I'm not sure. Especially bring it up on stream. I didn't make a video talking about how hard done by I was by the tour. In fact, Stefan and I sat down and we said, let's, we don't want this to overshadow how important this moment was. We don't want this to overshadow this crazy cultural media shift we affected in Australia. So we just won't talk about it. We won't tell anyone. We didn't get paid for anything. We won't sit there and try to claw back every bit of money back from these organizers, hire lawyers, go after them litigiously. Never, never did any of that. I just moved forward, worked on my videos again, and went off to make another big documentary. That, that was what was important. Not about, you know, getting back the people who had wronged me or whatever. Genuinely, genuinely, I don't know what has happened with their lives. I hope those tour organizers are doing fine, moving on, obviously not great. Hope they don't do that to anyone else, but 
None of that stuff was ever what was important to me. Now we're at the uh, f everyone arc in Lauren's life and I need a break for water. <laughs> it's been all my coffee crying because Brittany and I are at rock bottom right now, like rock bottom. The, the rock bottom where everything's funny. The only thing that could make this worse is if we were dying. Yeah. I have a feeling that From the moment we're born, we're dying, guys. meeting going on beside us of all these men in business suits, and they're probably like, oh, with classy young ladies. And then, like, five minutes later, it's devolved into, like, Kleenexes and, like, crying. So at this point, obviously, I am like, f everyone. I hate everyone in politics. I'm not going to associate with any of these people. I can't trust anyone. I need to just hunker down have people that are good around me, people that want to do real work and aren't just sitting here doing infighting and drama and clawing for more fame. So I make a video saying, listen, I'm done. Lauren and Chad said, I was the sound guy. That's the problem. I listen to all my music at deafening levels and probably should have had someone else edit this limp out. Oh my God. That's why we're having conversations. It seems like you're being a bad faith piece of shit, but you're just not hearing what I'm saying. That must be the case. Copium. With YouTube, I'm just doing documentaries. That's it. What's the biggest issue at this moment? The cultural peak, the mass exodus of people over the Mediterranean, from Turkey, from Morocco. Who is covering that on the ground? Who is actually looking at it from the starting points? Who's going to Turkey to where these people are beginning to walk to get on boats? No one is covering that. It's all just the mainstream media with all of their crazy slants saying every single person coming in is a refugee. There's no bad people no ISIS members, no economic migrants, and if you question any of this, you're a bigot. Of course, that's never the full story, and Kaylin George and I wanted to cover it the proper way with some real nuance and investigation. So we make our pitch, tell everyone we're filming Borderless. And what are we working on? Uh, we're working on a new fourth film, which is going to star. Stop. Um, it's going to be really good, and it's not porn. <laughs> Making a website right now. It's migrant porn. Look at all these DVDs. Get wonderful donations from I'm sure a lot of people who are still subscribed and watching and thank you so much. Like that meant that meant a lot that people still believed in me and wanted me to keep doing documentaries even if I wasn't doing YouTube as much. And get on a plane, head to Greece where they've got one of the largest migrant camps in the world, Moria. On a flight soon, but I figured I'd just kind of show you my packing so far. The boys needed a bunch of equipment, extra propellers and batteries for the drone. More Even her boxes of stuff are black. Lauren, you need more color in your wardrobe. More batteries for the Ronin. If you don't know what the Ronin is, it's like a, uh, it's that thing that holds the camera that makes sure it's all steady shots. <laughs> so wait, we're gonna put chocolate bars on the end? This is George's Basically, fitness plan. Yeah. yeah. I'm going on a ridiculously long trip and I managed to fit all my clothes in there. Get on a boat, take it over to Turkey, uh -oh. and I'll never forget those nights we spent patrolling the shores, speaking to all of farmers at patrolling? 3 a.m., sitting <laughs> what are you in a looking car for? until 7 a.m., until sunrise, trying to stay awake, having coffees, pushing each other, stay up, stay up, there might be migrants, just waiting on all of these shore banks every day. Is she considering the... <laughs> I'm sorry, Nara. We don't even have a bag. I don't know. My bag's packed. They're arguing about which camera is packed more compact, and they're having like a proper row about well, it. Well, look, his isn't even in the fucking bag. <laughs> I don't need to engage because I have nothing to prove. Like, George. Yeah, alright, Terrified, because some of these traffickers have AK-47s, some of them have guns, but we are like determined to get this story. Oh my gosh, we were insane people. Turkey, like, they jail more journalists than North Korea. If you get arrested in Turkey, you are done. And we're sitting there going on migrant trafficking <coughs> routes, walking with them, filming them, getting ourselves majorly implicated. And we did actually eventually get arrested and we were facing years and years in Turkish jail, but that is a story for another time. Oh my gosh, we were idiots, but. We were idiots with a cause. We were idiots that really, really believed in what we were doing. So we, we get our reports in Turkey and we decide we're gonna go head up further down the border and check out different locations. It would have been ridiculous o'clock. We're driving in the car and Kaylin looks at me and, and says something that really took me back. He said, Lauren, I, I need to go back to London. I say, London, we're in the middle of filming. What, what, the, what the fuck are you talking about, Kaylin? 
He says, I need to go meet with Hope Not Hate. Obviously, I am very taken aback. If you don't know who the group Hope Not Hate is, I of course do, because I've had many run-ins with them. One, they got me banned from Britain, and they got my Patreon account taken down by lobbying the organization. And unfortunately, I met them once after that to confront them about getting my Patreon taken down. So I, I was very aware of this group, their nefarious acts, not great guys, ruined many lives of people I enjoyed, and my own. So I'm like, Kaylin, why do you have to meet with Hope Not Hate? What is going on here? He tells me this organization are blackmailing him, essentially. They are threatening both him and George with jail time, saying they're speaking to the British police, saying they're talking with intelligence agencies, that they've connected Kaylin and George with multiple radical events, including the Day for Freedom. They've connected them with the rise of hatred in London and the UK due to working with Tommy Robinson and making work for me. And that they're going to use all this information to get them jailed, questioned, put on lists so that they can't travel anymore, unless they come and speak to the group and give them information. They're a pressure group. They're a very persuasive organization. And because they're non-government, they can get up to all sort of nefarious stuff. I absolutely believe Kaylin and George and still do to this day that they were being threatened. I absolutely believe that. Um, I've met with Hope Not Hate once myself. <laughs> a lot of you know, but you don't know the actual context, as I mentioned earlier. And right after my Patreon ban, I was invited to meet with them and I accepted it under the sole condition that I called multiple friends of mine that were in politics. I called Brittany Pettibone and told her about it. And then I called a journalist with Breitbart and told him I was meeting with them. And I intended to record the entire meeting to try to expose that Hope Not Hate had in fact lobbied Patreon because Patreon were not being so upfront about having being lobbied. And they didn't want to admit that it was a NGO that pressured them rather than their own policies. So we met to- we went Okay, to Jesus, hold on. This guy keeps coming in chat. Destiny, too scared to answer, I guess. You guys saw a lot about this, but you certainly would agree that Islam is the worst religion. I don't think I would make a stereotypical statement about all of Islam. It's a religion of like fucking two billion people. Much the same, I wouldn't make a stereotypical statement about like Christianity. Would you agree Christianity is good or bad? Like religious faiths, one, have tons of different sub-disciplines, um, what do you call it, denominations within them. And then even within the denominations, different people act in different ways. So no, I'm not, if you're looking for like a blanket statement on any massive religion that like over a billion people follow, you're probably not gonna find one from me, my dude. To this pub in London, <clears throat> and I, I have a little camcorder. In fact, I think I have it now, let me grab it. I would take this everywhere I went, have it hooked to my backpack so that I could record if I needed it, and it also would record audio. So I actually have the footage of that bar that night we met them of me sitting on the toilet, turning this on and just looking down at it and putting it in my purse and putting it under the table. Unfortunately, of course, not thinking, the audio came out horrendously because it was in my purse under the table. So you could barely hear any of it. I mean, I've still got it to this day, so I'll try to adjust some of it, but you probably won't be able to hear any of it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We got into a yelling match nice. over political disagreements and stormed out of the pub after an hour. Never met with them again. Never again. We had that one meeting and I actually ended up using it in my court case against Patreon later on. Kaylin and George then tell me like, listen, Lauren, we have to go meet with them. We have to try to smooth things over. We're terrified. We're not going to be able to travel anymore. We're going to go to jail. We don't know how we're going to smooth it over, but there is absolutely no way we're going to compromise you. There's no way we're going to compromise Tommy. And it's important to mention that Kaylin and George were not just working for me at this point. They were working for Tommy. They were working for Stefan Molyneux. They were working for Alex Jones. They were working for a ton of people. Um, and they were like, listen, we've told Tommy about it. It's all going to be okay. They basically just want to know that with Joe, be so careful about what you say. Oh, of course. Well, look what's happened now because of bullshit I've said. Hold on. My hope not hate handler is calling me right now. <laughs> I, would they have been recording me when we went in? If they were, you were super defensive and you were basically just arguing with Nick. So there was no... You recorded them anyway, didn't you? Yeah, there was nothing. I, I don't have the recording. I was recording it when you said what? Um, there's this left-wing organization called Hope Not Hate in, uh, in Britain, and they basically, like, full-time, um, infiltrate, infiltrate the right. It's a shame. Um, unfortunately, all they really care about is that it's not organizing the extreme protests. 
go to prison for? At this point, for? all I care about. Oh, oh, somebody posted this on my subreddit. This is actually true, actually, and I, I can see this. Yo, the one thing that America does so much better, I've said this a lot and I'll say it again, thank fucking God we don't have dog shit fucking hate speech laws in this country. That is some, that is one of the few things where when Americans are like, we're freer than you guys, you guys are wild. People in the UK tweet the N-word at somebody and you go to fucking jail? That shit is crazy, holy fuck. You guys are wild over there when it comes to actual hate speech laws. Um, which is funny because you, you guys have the hate speech laws that I think conservatives in the United States sometimes think we have, but we don't, but um, Jesus. Is my movie getting done? And as long as they're not causing any trouble, as long as Tommy knows. <laughs> not the average person, you dickhead? Wrong. No, that is not true. It is the average person. It happened the last time there was a football game. There were like average random people would like tweeting out, like calling some football player the N word and they would like get prison time for it. Or they'd get big fines for it. Um, it isn't just celebrities or people that drum up like violence or whatever. I'm pretty sure like on the books in the UK, you have actual hate speech laws to where if they can prove that you tweeted out something, like you can get fined or like get jail sentences or whatever for it. Like it's insane. Um, geez. As long as they're not actually compromised, I, I just care about borderless. That's my baby. That's my project. That's where my focus is. <sighs> it did get done. It did get filmed. Everything was fantastic. Kaylin and George were risking their lives with me on this trip. I'm sorry, maybe publicly, you guys don't believe that they were not compromised, but the guys almost went to jail with me for five years. I think I've got a bit of a better insight. <laughs> Fast forward. Fast forward, we're in LA, we're filming the last bits of Borderless, the introduction, conclusion, all of this. Seeing this guy I really like, life is starting to get a bit more normal. I'm seriously considering leaving politics at this point because everything is so messy and so much of my visions of what I thought the conservative political world would be, so many of my visions of how I thought people would be. And, you know, I, I obviously believed everyone was as passionate and genuine as I was about wanting to change things, about wanting to save the West, all this stuff, right? I had been so black-pilled. A lot of that, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed approach had really died at that point. So I really was seriously considering quitting and taking a step back or changing something. And out of nowhere, while I'm sitting there in my friend's apartment in LA, I get a call. Calls are never good in my life, it seems from Tommy Robinson, the ghost of Christmas past, right? I'm like, what is Tommy doing calling me? I haven't seen him in ages. I've been banned from the UK, right? Pick up the phone and Tommy is frantic saying, Lauren, did you know that Caitlin and George are working for Hope Not Hate? Have you heard of this? Do you know? And I'm like, Tommy, like you, what, what are you talking about? And he's like, he starts telling me Oh, Kaylin and George were talking to Hope Not Hate this day and that day. And I'm like, you know this. I know you know this. We've talked about it before. You know, you've met with Hope Not Hate, Tommy. <laughs> you've met with Nick Lowe's before. Well, he, he starts having these conversations with me about Kaylin and George's actions that it, it was a very strange conversation. It didn't seem real because he was talking about a bunch of stuff that he already knew. A bunch of things he already knew, was aware of, and repeating them as if he didn't know them. And I got a bit of a creeping suspicion that this was a setup call. It wasn't actually a real conversation I was having with Tommy. So I asked him, Tommy, are you recording this conversation? Is there something weird going on here? And he goes, no, no, Lauren, I would never record our conversation. That's, that's bizarre, no. For the few people that are aspiring actors in this space or, <coughs> or any other space, always assume every convo, whenever you're typing things, especially when it's with intimate parties and you're like, this will never leak, always consider like, how will this look if it goes public? How would this like always be considering that? It is so important to always be considering that because the exact type of stuff that you think would never leak is probably gonna be the type of stuff that if it fucks you will be the stuff that gets leaked, right? Um, always be aware of that. Like motherfuckers will record everything. You should be recording conversations that you think are gonna get dicey. Um, just always be aware of shit like that. Of course not. <sighs> Joke's on me. I didn't think about this for months and months afterwards until it came out that Tommy was in fact recording our call. And he was doing it because the BBC were planning a massive expose on him as cocaine, hookers, I don't know. I, I never kept up with the whole drama. But essentially, Hope Not Hate were trying to use the blackmail they had on Kalen to get him to go 
and do this BBC documentary exposing Tommy. But Kaylin had warned Tommy about the BBC documentary because, as I said, he was telling Tommy the whole time about everything going on. And so Tommy wanted to, by any means necessary, stop this BBC documentary from going to air, including secretly recording people, including um, getting pre-recordings of the BBC documentaries, courtesy of Lucy and Kaylin helping him out. Wait, pause. You may be wondering why Lucy Brown is helping Tommy at this point. Wasn't she excommunicated, betrayed by him? Yeah, she was. But when the BBC and Hope Not Hate reached out to her to get her to throw Tommy under the bus for their film, she decided she hated them more than she hated Tommy and approached him with the idea of secretly infiltrating their whole project. I've just included an excerpt from a response she sent to Nick Lowe's from Hope Not Hate when he questioned her as to why the hell would you save Tommy after everything he did to you? Lucy Brown is a lot of things, but an Antifa spy, snake, disloyal, nah, she's none of those. And... It was all just such a mess. The way the BBC were behaving was incredibly unethical, blackmailing people to get subjects in their film, using Hope Not Hate and NGO to work with them. That's the reason it never went to air. But then the- Florida is, Florida is a two-party consent state. Does it matter to you who's recording convo? I don't ever give a fuck about the law when it comes to recording conversations. Like, w like l would I ever risk my reputation because it might be illegal to record a fucking conversation? Fuck that. I'd rather take the penalties and like exonerate my character, right? You can like pay a fine or do whatever you have to do through court, but you can never get your name back. The behavior Tommy was partaking in to try to explain to the public and to try to stop it from getting released was also completely unethical. Like he included spliced up recordings from my call with him that were completely out of context where I said, Hey, yeah, I met with Hope Not Hate, so did you. And uh, like, it was just this short meeting in 2017 where we had this massive like blow up confrontation and I never saw them again. Cutting out all the context to that and only including, I met with Hope Not Hate. Trying to make it seem like there was this giant CIA plot against him, including myself and all these other people that weren't actually involved at all. You're aware they've been meeting with them regularly? I, I've met Joe too before. Yeah, I, I, like I know, I know that. Kaylin and George have met with them before. Continually met with them when you was doing your borderless documentary. Hope not hate flew out to Italy to meet them. I don't know what they were talking about, but for the most part, like I think they're like they're just afraid of them. It was all a very very strange time, but oh my gosh, did that cause the rumor mill to start talking about how I was a secret hope not hate spy? True. It, it made me really sad too because I would have been perfectly willing to speak to Tommy just in an interview on camera and tell him, oh yeah, no, I, I disagree with what the BBC is doing. I think this is wrong. This is what happened. Tell him the whole story. Would have been completely happy to do all of that. But it can't just be, you know, a complex story of exposing what the BBC did wrong. It had to be a total victory for Tommy, even if that meant destroying the reputations of me and everyone else around him, as long as it was a total Tommy victory. And it was the same shit I had seen over and over and over again, from Milo to Ezra to Faith to the tour managers, over and over again, just people screwing over everyone around them to save their own ass and not telling the full story to their audiences, not explaining what had happened because it's too complicated. So they need a simple story where they're just the good guy and everyone else is villains. And this is the point this has all been leading up to. It's still hard for me to even think about or talk about today, but Borderless is published. It's done really well. People loved the movie. We've had some massive exposés of criminal behavior from NGOs, incredible on the ground interviews with human traffickers. It was really a beautiful thing. I'm really proud of that movie, but I'm sick. I'm tired of politics. I cannot stand all of the backstabbing. I cannot stand the behavior, the selfishness, all of it. And I think it's making me a worse person too, because I'm at the point where I can't even talk to people or make friends or trust anyone in this world. I don't want to live like that. I don't want to be like that, right? So I'm, I just want to start a family. I just want to start a family. Um, I was actually married at this point when Borderless was released. Nobody knew that. And my husband and I had decided to have a child and um, he's Australian, so I wanted to be able to go to Australia, visit family, of course, and see family, but there was one problem. 
because of everything I had done in politics, because of all the activism I had done, South Africa, borderless, all of it, I had been put on a list called VACU. It is typically for criminals and terrorists that can't travel to other countries because they've got a record that won't allow them to enter other countries. And I had been put on that list due to my political activism. And it meant that I couldn't get a visa to go to Australia. And I had been advised the only way that I was going to be able to see my family, grandparents of my child, was if I quit politics all together. So what I kind of expected to be like a slow trickle out, calm down, maybe do a few videos here and there, but settle down out of the political sphere ended up being a full cutoff just publish a letter and say goodbye to everyone, shut down all my social media, shut down my subscription site, all of it, instantly. Otherwise, my visa was going to be rejected and I was never gonna be able to enter the country. And that's what I did. Right after Borderless came out, published, I'm leaving, I'm quitting. Just a nice little letter I emailed out to people and said goodbye, said I wanted to focus on family. I didn't talk about why, I didn't tell anyone about the Australia vacuum stuff because that would probably jeopardize my visa too. I couldn't publicly discuss, you know, the, those government affairs and problems. And I was lucky enough that right after I published that letter, I did get a response that said, Your visa I'm not skipping parts of the video. You put the whole video out. So we're watching the whole video. Stop spamming my chat. This has been accepted. You're allowed to visit the country now, but it's on the one stipulation that you have quit politics and you will never you will never violate any of our character assessment standards again. I kind of wanted quitting to be on my own terms, which made me sad because it wasn't on my terms. It wasn't really on my terms. It was on the government's terms. I, I definitely feel like the end of my political career was stolen from me by that. Uh, <laughs> sorry. It's really nice to tell people what actually happened. You know, I think a lot of people, especially like a lot of my biggest supporters, they felt very abandoned. They felt like I just disappeared and left them and I didn't give any explanation, but it wasn't because of that. There, were, there was a lot more going on in the background that I never spoke about. You know, there are definitely times where I wish I could go back and tell myself never to go to that conference to just stay in the army. I don't think I would have believed me if I told me what happened. I don't think I would have believed governments would stop people from entering countries and seeing family just over their political opinions, maybe over terrorism, extremism. Like I can't even visit. It's not even like, it's not even immigration. It's like, I can't even visit people that I love anymore in many countries in the world just because of my opinions, my opinions that are held by most people in these countries. But, um, fair, the boat thing probably played into a little bit too, I would imagine. When but. it came to career, when it came to how this would affect my family, my friends, I didn't think it would be so extreme or ever get to this point. But I, that's also part of the reason that I believed in everything I did so much. I could see... Or maybe not so actually, I wouldn't know I wouldn't know what Australia is using stifled. as their guidelines so for people letting have people in or not. And were so afraid and I wanted to be that voice for people and being that voice for people obviously had risks that... I was willing to take, but probably didn't fully understand when I got into politics. A lot of story to tell, so let's, let's get back to it, because it somehow gets worse. So then I've quit, I've published my letter, I'm gonna go be with my family. And then I get a text from Milo Yiannopoulos, which if you've been paying attention so far is never a good omen. Milo calls on the phone and he's irate about Kaylin and George. And I just don't care at this point. I tell Milo, listen, I'm married. I'm starting a family. I've got these visa issues. I can't talk about anything. I can't be involved in anything publicly. Please just leave me alone. He is so angry though, he is going off saying, Lauren, you need to help me. You need to do something for me right now. If I were in a room with Caitlin and George, I would put a shotgun in their mouths and I would blow their brains out right now. I hate them and they need to pay. And you are going to help me with it. Lauren, us beautiful people, he would always talk like this. It was so strange. Us beautiful people of people attack us all the time. They're always after us, aren't they? 
And Lauren, I have all of this horrible gossip about you from ugly women that are jealous of you, his words. And I would hate to have to publish it because you didn't want to give me any blackmail on Kaylin and George. All I need from you is a disavowal. All I need is for you to tell me that they stole things from you. They stole from you, didn't they? They stole equipment from you. They, they scammed you. They're just horrible people, aren't they? And all that kept flashing back into my head was that conversation about Alam I had years ago where he told me Alan was a secret Antifa spy and this horrible evil person that needed to be taken out and all he needed was a little bit of blackmail on him. It brought me back to Margaret. Lauren, don't you remember what an awful person Margaret was? Stole all the privilege grant money? Oh, and then it turns out Milo actually had the privilege grant money. And I just, I had, I was sick of it. I wanted none of it. I was like, Milo, no, I'm not gonna give you black- Wait, so did he really just get away with the stealing all the grant money? Did that, did nothing ever come of that publicly or privately or legally or anything? Did you know that Milo is selling Virgin Mary statues on some Christian infomercial channel now? Is that true? I thought he was going with Marjorie Taylor Greene. Mail on them. They haven't stolen from me. I don't want to be involved in any of this. And half the questions you're asking me are extremely leading and completely untrue. So I just told him, no, no, Milo. You know what? Write what you will about me. I don't want to be involved in it. I can't. And Milo's like, oh, sweetie, darling. Just, I'll send you an email. Don't worry about it. So Milo sends me an email after, and I, I want to read you some of the questions in it, because it was just insane. It was not journalism, not even remotely. His questions, he says, not in any particular order. When did you first find out Kaylin was stealing from Tommy Robinson? When did you find out they were stealing from Ezra Levant? Did you employ them knowing they'd previously stolen money or engaged in financial fraud, including inflated invoices? How much money did they steal from you? When did you find out they were working with Hope Not Hate? Wait, real quick. Milo's selling candles. All right, listen to this. Um, uh, gay British man. Frank, like, and <clears throat> Kath, I'm not off by saying I am now. Yes. Hello, and welcome to the Church Militant Shop. My name is Milo Yiannopoulos, and I'm here with my co-host, Deborah Vaughan. How are you doing today, Deborah? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm well. I'm Good. happy because this is the first of our shows, and we're beginning today with, well, probably the most important woman in history, wouldn't you say? I think so. She's certainly the most beloved, and we've got today uh, three items, all in celebration, reverence, of course, of the Blessed Mother. Extremely uh, powerful religious items here. <laughs> if you're ever... Wait a ton. This has to be... This has to be like the worst thing. I think I mentioned that um, the uh, Best of Enemies movie, there's a quote at the end, or there's like a line at the end where people talk about how some people live in the in the public eye for so long. The really interesting thing is to see what their lives look like as kind of the cameras shut off and the publicity fades away. And for some of these people, it's almost impossible to imagine like, what do you look like when there's no camera on you? And Milo, at least to me, Milo hardcore comes off as one of those people. Like, are you even a real human being? Do you exist outside of the public perception of you? Or, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know him well enough to say, you know. <clears throat> but. When did you find out they had shared Gavin's location with Antifa? This is Milo's worst world line if he was in Stein's game. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> what was your reaction? If the boys stole from you and took advantage of you, even supposing you not, knew nothing about their activities, why did you continue to employ them? Did they ever threaten you? Do you have any idea why people would say you knew about everything? Did you ever hear Kaylin put a tracker in Tommy Robinson's car? It wasn't, did they steal? It was, when did they steal? How much did they steal? Milo even had accused them on the phone. He said, did they steal all the Australia money? Obviously. Obviously my reaction was, this is nonsense. First of all, Kaylin and George, George wasn't even in Australia. Kaylin came and didn't get paid anything. The tour managers stole all the money. So I knew Milo was just taking shots in the dark, trying to get as much dirt on these guys as possible. I didn't fully understand why Milo hated them so much. All I knew was that anyone who crossed Milo, even for completely legitimate reasons, had their lives absolutely destroyed or attacked by him. And once again, I wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. So I just said, listen, if you send me proof that they doxed Gavin and shared his location with Antifa, if you show me proof that they put trackers in his car, if you show me proof for any of this, for any of this theft, any of it, 
I'll disavow it, of course, Milo, of course. But he never sent me any, nothing. Nothing, never sent me a stick of proof. In fact, um, <laughs> I later found out there was a guy who sent me a DM on Instagram. He said, Milo messaged me and told me I needed to write to him saying Kaylin and George stole from me. And he tried to leverage the fact that he let me write for his website Dangerous once and said, you owe me one, so I need you to write a message saying Kaylin and George stole from you for, for his article. And he said, I've never met Kaylin and George. I've never worked with them. I've never used their equipment before. How could they have stolen from me when I've never known them? But once again, Milo did not care about the facts involved. Even if there were nefarious things that Kaylin and George did, it wasn't, Milo wouldn't have cared. It wouldn't have been enough. He has to lie in everything he does. Oh, it was just so insane. So I was just so sick of it. I was like, I'm not going to disavow them. I'm not going to throw them under the bus for you. I don't know what you've got up your sleeve. If you hate them, that's between you and them. Leave me out of it. He called me multiple times, threatened me multiple times. I begged him, just leave me alone. I've got my family stuff. I just want out of this world and your world. I remember the last, um, I got one last text from him before never speaking to the man again, which said, Lauren, I'm giving you one last opportunity to throw Kaylin and George under the bus. And I actually have a screenshot of that text. Now would be the time to throw them under the bus. Tommy's going in pretty hard on the record. Let me know your thoughts. I'm sad that you would write some of the things you would, especially when they are untrue. He knew fully what he was doing. He wasn't trying to get information to expose the truth to the right wingers. I gotta get the truth out there, right? It was, I'm gonna threaten you and you're gonna throw these people under the bus for me. Throw them under the bus, those words directly, um, so I can destroy their life because they crossed me. That's all, that's what it was. Of course, I have no interest in that. But unfortunately, a lot of fucking people in politics do. They're willing to throw anyone and everyone under the bus to keep Milo off their ass, to keep anyone off their ass from, to save their career. At this point, I wasn't working with Kaylin and George anymore. They were off doing work for Stefan Molyneux. They were working with Alex Jones. They were working with Tommy Robinson, although probably half and half behind the scenes at this point. <clears throat> and I, I then saw they were working on a film called You Can't Watch This. And I asked Kaylin about it. I was like, what is going on with this Milo stuff? Why is he contacting me? And Kaylin just sent me a text from Milo saying, it probably has something to do with this. I wish I could say the start of all of this wasn't so fucking petty as to be ridiculous. I wish I could say it was over something serious. I wish I could say all of this actually were about Kaylin and George working for Hope Not Hate and betraying people on the right wing. Because then at least I would have some faith, a smidge of faith in the right wing. It is ludicrous to make a movie like this without me in it. A joke. I am patient zero for everything. No. Also, go fuck yourself, you treacherous slime bag. Your day in the barrel is coming. I am coming for you. You will not know when or how, but I am coming for you. That is an actual message Milo sent Kaylin and George. An actual message. Based. Simply because he was not included in a film they were making for Alex Jones. That's all. Much like the Australia tour, much like the stuff with Alan, much like the stuff with Margaret, if you don't include him, if he is not the number one feature in everything, I should have messaged the guys from that context or reason or whatever fucking channel when they did that Hassan video. <laughs> you guys are talking about the start of Twitch politics without me? <laughs> I don't think so. That would have been base. True, we need more Milo energy on this stream. Day in the barrel is coming. Absolutely insane. Psychopathic behavior. And so their day in the barrel did come. And mine too, apparently, as I refused to throw them under the bus. Uh, Milo published an article called Safe Farewell to the Klepto Queens of the Far Right, in which every ridiculous accusation he wrote in that email to me that never got any confirmation or any proof to it, he published as fact. He published just as 100% fact in this piece. One of my favorite things, because I've gone and I've looked up this article, um, just because I was curious to read it. Is it like almost every single thing Milo puts in here is like two anonymous sources, anonymous source who won't want to be named, anonymous, like every single source from that email. I think almost every single one that I saw was an anonymous source, which I thought was really funny for me. Based Sigma way to write articles. I knew within the first 
minute of reading this article, it was complete nonsense. <laughs> if I went through all the accusations in this article, it would be another four hours of this video, but I could. I could easily go through and debunk 99% of the things, at least anything I was involved in. <laughs> oh, so 1% so, like, is true. One email says that the boys stole $10,000 from me and they put a screenshot saying, hey, we're missing $10,000 in travel expenses. But if you actually read the full email, you'll see at the bottom it says receipts. We're missing the receipts. We need to get them in so we can file them for tax season, which is completely reasonable in what every properly operating business does. So that's just how Milo would operate. He'd take one piece of evidence and say, look, I've got this one piece of evidence and then extrapolate a ton of stuff that didn't happen. But as long as he had that one reference that people didn't read into that much, he could pretend it was a receipt for all of the lies he would write. There was another bit where he had an email there were late rentals, late returns. And he said, look, they defrauded all these rental companies. And it's like, no, they were late returning stuff to the rental companies. I've done that a million times. Anyone who works in film is like, oh, shoot, we went over five hours with filming. We'll return it in the morning and you get a late notice. It was just like absurd how scorched earth he was going to the point that he's just lying, lying. Uh, anyone who was involved in the article or was quoted knows it was a lie. Lucy Brown, who is cited in the piece, spoken to her a million times. She couldn't believe what came out after she spoke to Milo. She couldn't believe how much her words were twisted. Spoke to Alex Jones after the piece was released. And he apologized and said, I can't believe all of this was written about you guys. I'm so sorry. I'm probably never going to have Milo on the show again after witnessing this, which is probably kind of sweet justice as that first meeting that I had with Milo in Los Angeles. Uh, the advice he gave me in 2015 was to never go on Alex Jones's show. <laughs> That's just a random little tidbit. There was only one part of this article that I really hope was true because it's funny as shit if it is, but Milo claims that Kalen and George doctored all of Tommy Robinson's videos <laughs> to make him have a chipmunk voice, which is hysterical, if real. But that's what? a very funny accusation. But um, Now, one thing I really want to hit on is you'll notice most of this article is about how Kalen and George screwed over Tommy Robinson, how they were stealing from him, ruining his life, trying to get him killed, trying to dox his family, all this stuff. And Tommy never said any, anything publicly to deny this, right? In fact, I think Milo may even have a bit in the article where Tommy says it's all true. <laughs> so if you think this video is all just about how Milo fucked up, Tommy is not off the hook here either, because this was some pretty, I, I think it was pretty awful to this day that he didn't come out and say this was a lie. The real tea is Tommy loved working with Kalen and George and he was pissed when he got out of prison and Kalen and George were off filming Borderless with me. He was thinking, what? who's gonna film my videos? Who's gonna work with me? You are my crew. You have made me successful. You are mine, not Lauren's crew. It wasn't the case that it was like, Kalen and George are Lauren's personal crew and Tommy was trying to get rid of them no matter what. No, it was the opposite. Tommy would show up to Kaylin and George's house with suitcases of cash, begging them to come back and work for him. But they didn't want to do it anymore because it was too much fucking drama. Way too much drama. They just wanted to do documentaries with me and potentially even the work- The way that she pronounces things like actually genuinely upsets me. It actually like triggers the fuck out of me. <laughs> their way out of politics altogether. They were never particularly political people. They just liked doing art stuff. They liked doing movies. So Tommy still, still, even when this article was published was still trying to work with Kalen and George yet allowed the perception of them being these horrible villains to persist to keep his reputation as the victim. <laughs> Milo alleges that the reason Tommy kept working with them and was still working with them when the article was published was because they were blackmailing him and threatening him. It just it's Tommy Robinson. You know, you think two gay guys are threatening Tommy Robinson and forcing Tommy to do videos with them? The whole idea is just absurd. Caelan Robinson, who stole 20,000 pound Bitcoin and was sacked by me. Caelan yeah? Robinson, with no evidence or nothing, is their source of information for all of these allegations. <laughs> Real so I said, read the allegations, and I'm not stupid. One of them is about prostitution cocaine. Now I know what's coming. I know a headline's coming across all the national media, Tommy Robinson prostitutes cocaine. I know it's coming. That's where the money went. That's where the money went. Yeah? A few weeks after this article was published, they were in a studio filming all together. I have the footage of it. Tommy, Kaylin, and George all together, smiling, laughing, joking. 
Kaylin, in fact, has sent me thousands of messages between the two of them, all post this article being published in which they were exposed as blackmailing, trying to kill Tommy, everything of Tommy begging them to do work together, saying, hey, we're going to do this project. We're going to do this book. We're going to film this and that. Look, once I've done the grooming documentary, call it The Rape of Britain, and we use Easy Meat statistics and we update them for the current day. That's a book idea, mate. I'm I can't, I can't, I can't do Monday, I'm not here. Maybe we just get the warehouse done and... Cool, I'll, I'll ring her in a bit. Can we book? Book it for as early as possible. All right, yeah, le 11's still cool then. We can still do, yeah, still do 11. Yeah, cool. Well, I've done the same, ca um, I've, I've... I'm Yo, everywhere. good morning, good morning, good morning, bro. Sorry, mate, it's chasing you on that thing. I want to watch it. Brilliant. Remember we had the screenshot, bro. Kaylin, you know the photo you... Yeah, don't matter, bro. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, all right, bro. It's the same thing since dot one of meeting the three of them. There had been too much shit that had happened publicly. Tommy had blamed them for too much of his problems, much like Lucy Brown, made them the scapegoat for everything, but didn't have a good enough film crew to replace them, so kept begging them to work with him privately behind the scenes while lying to his audience, pretending they weren't working together. And they were these horrible, awful traitors. And it was the most disgusting shit. I, oh, it was so disgusting, so disgusting to watch. I mean, Tommy had his reasons, but to me, they're still inexcusable. So when people look at me today and they're like, oh, but can't you see that Kaylin and George are these awful traitors that went and worked for the left wing and they went and exposed all these right wingers. And you know, now they're working for this huge left wing media company. I'm not surprised. I'm, it doesn't surprise me. They were so screwed over and treated horrendously by everyone they worked for in media. You'll notice they don't really say much about me, right? And they were never. She's still blackmailing political. them. Oh no! They weren't these like big like yes, I'm a huge right winger. Let's fight for the fight. They were just artists that got into this world of politics and decided, holy shit. There's no way we're staying in here. Everyone's blackmailing each other. Everyone hates each other. If I don't include this one gay guy in a movie, he's gonna, he wants to kill me with a shotgun. Why the hell would they want to stay in right-wing politics? And this is the real hard pill that people have to swallow. You can't just call people traitors that you run out of your own movement. You can't just sit there and claim to be a victim of Kaylin and George after you spread a bunch of rumors about them, you lie about them, you make them hate every single thing about the right and then pretend you're the victim. <laughs> it's like, until the right can accept that they are chasing people away, it's not gonna grow, it's not gonna get better, and it's certainly not gonna get better when they're chasing away the only artists in their movement. And I just wanna to touch on this once more editing because I know a lot of you will probably go to the media and look up Kaylin and George and wonder what have they done since and yeah, they have absolutely gone and done exposés on the right at this point. They have both come out and said they hate it all. It was just full of cocaine hookers and scam artists. They've obviously gone to the media and done this stuff now. And yeah, they they did experience and witness a lot of that stuff. So they're not well, It's even like a lying. reverse Rittenhouse. I told them at the time, I remember when they initially just said, F it, we're, we're leaving politics and we're turning against the right. I said, don't do it, guys. This is just going to confirm in people's minds that you guys were actually the traitors the entire time. But at that point, they genuinely did just dislike the right. They, they, it wasn't false. At that point, it had grown to such a point where they're like, this is just an awful movement. And I hate to say, they had a very human reaction. They weren't activists like I was. Not everyone can sit in silence for years being slandered like I did to protect the reputations of people in a political movement because you're... You still have these ideals about this cause you were fighting for. So still to this day, even though they came to dislike the politics, even though they came to dislike what I did and what I still do and are working against it, I understand why. I understand why. I said I get through this and I'm going to get through this. One day. I got this. Remember when I mentioned that text from Milo where he said, I have one last chance. One last chance to throw Kalen and George under the bus. Well, I gotta give the man credit. He has follow through for his threats, right? He told me, I've got a bunch of gossip from ugly women, his words, that are jealous of you. And I would hate to put it in my article, Lauren, but just gonna have to do it if you aren't willing to throw Kalen and George under the bus. 
I guess my one crime in politics was I was uh, one of the few people that just wouldn't f over my support staff over and over again to save my own career. <laughs> Should have learned my lesson. But um, yeah, he definitely followed through with that threat. And if you get to, I don't know, halfway through the article, he begins with his discussion of Lauren Southern and how I was involved in all of this fraudulent behavior, how I was all part of the plan secretly talking to hope not hate but even worse everything i did was a lie everything i did wasn't actually me it was all written for me by men that i was blackmailing and sleeping with for content <laughs> is there any more of a classic go-to attack a woman thing you can grasp onto than nothing she did was her own and she fucked her way to the top I'll give him that. I'll give him credit for picking the, the most hard-hitting attack you can get on the right towards a woman, right? Really twisting the knife point of this bit was where he says, Alan Bokhari was the one who ghost wrote all of my stuff and that I was blackmailing Alan Bokhari to write for me. Now that wouldn't really hit anyone the same way reading that article other than people who knew about what had happened with Alan at the beginning of this video. That it was in fact the opposite. Milo was blackmailing Alan and Alan was writing all of Milo's content. But he knew he could get away with saying the exact opposite in this piece and that I could not respond. Getting a little extra dagger to the back there, right? So of course, Alan was kind enough to send me a text after this article went up and said, Lauren, obviously none of this is true. Do you want me to say something publicly? And at the time I said, let's just ignore it. I don't think anyone's going to care. It's Milo. There's no evidence. I was a bit wrong. A lot of people did care for some reason. Um, but Milo or Alum did eventually publish a tweet saying that this was all nonsense and lies, which was extremely kind of him, like a stand up guy, really stand up guy. And then the rest of the men that Milo alleges I slept with from, for content were all anonymous. Based anonymous, all... like the women that I raped in that one, uh, in that one article or whatever. <laughs> An anonymous source. Based anonymous sources. Of course. An anonymous source says, which we all know what an anonymous source means in a Milo article. It means Milo's imagination and just what, what he wanted to be in the piece. But f that pissed me off. It really pissed me off because so many people believed it. So many, I... And I'd like to think that anyone who read this article could go to my YouTube channel and click top videos and see that the vast majority of my most popular videos are streeters live would have been impossible to sleep with someone to write them for me. But, you know, that's that's the best accusation you can go with for for trying to take down, especially a woman on the right. She has no ideas of her own. She slept her way to the top. All of that. Oof. Maybe so mad, especially knowing, and, and Milo would have known this too, couldn't respond to any of it. My, uh, Milo must have a really low estimation of his readers because he literally insinuated that I may have slept with my gay video editor for my scripts, George, Kaylin's partner. <laughs> um, in truth, George is a wonderful writer and I would send my scripts to him to correct and he'd send me quite catty notes back about what I did wrong and right in them and absolutely every single person in politics has people they send notes to, has people that help them with their writing. No, no shot. Obviously Milo knows this, having Alan ghostwrite all of his stuff, but um, I have a very, very, very small pool of people that I respect enough to help me edit my work. Kaylin and George absolutely uh, would help edit my projects. And I had one really good friend that uh, would help me with speeches and work and a girlfriend of mine that would assist as well, but not one of them that I ever slept with, <laughs> not one. In fact, it's kind of become a running joke now when I have a friend edit my script. I'll, if, I, if I'm talking about dollars with the amounts, I'll just say I'll give you 100 sex to do a look over of my work. I wonder if there's some guy that's like, Helping our edit shit that's actually unironically like adding that a lot. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Today, so it's become a bit of a joke now, but obviously at the time it was really, really infuriating to see all my work undermined like that. One thing that made me extra emotional about this bit of the article was I had spent so much time in my life standing up for men who were falsely accused. 
men who are falsely accused of rape, of nefarious actions, whatever it may be, mostly based on the argument of innocent until proven guilty. We need to look at the evidence. And to have all of these red pill YouTubers, Meninists, MGTOW, MRAs, make videos coming out just uncritically believing everything that had been said about me, that that pissed me off, you know? According to an article released by the now very desperate Milo Yiannopoulos on his website Dangerous.com, Lauren's two gay employees and cameramen, Kaylin Robertson and George Lou and John, were involved in all sorts of fraudulent money-making schemes and risky backstabbing behavior, which Lauren Southern was clearly aware of during the filming of her documentary. Port I think one of my favorite things too, you can look at that Milo article if you think I'm lying, because I don't think I am, but I, I remember reading, um, or I'm misquoting it, it's not intentionally, but I think I remember reading, there were a couple points in that article where he would talk about how like, and this is a point where they stole like $163 from whatever. And I always feel like when somebody's gotten to the level where they're like getting that granular about crime, it makes me wonder, you know? <laughs> Orderless. Simply put, Lauren milked the majority of her thirsty fans for a few years and could now afford to burn out in the world of politics and retire early with the money she had made off her naive fans. Here's, here's what a lot of people um, don't realize is so much of the political is personal. When you see videos about Lauren Southern was a fraud, there's a good shot that that person feels scorned by me in one way or another. And it had absolutely nothing to do with them genuinely believing these things and everything to do with them wanting a chance to take a shot back at me because they're upset with me. Typically because I didn't date them or didn't sleep with them. That's, that's just a sad, sad reality. Um, <laughs> Let me take you back to filming Borderless a few years. I remember sitting at a cafe in Vienna and there's this one YouTuber named Squatting Slav TV. And oh, it was the creepiest thing ever. I had posted a photo of a napkin and a cup at a cafe. And I come out from the bathroom at the cafe to go back to my seat and I see this man standing there looking down at his phone and looking up at the sign above the cafe, looking at the napkins and looking around and then he sees me and like zeroes in and starts making a beeline for me. And I look up and I'm like, who is this guy? What is he doing here? He looks down and he's like, hello? Are you Lauren? Are you Lauren? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm squatting Slav TV. Are you? And like asks me to sit at my table with me and I can see he found where I was in Vienna by looking at my Instagram story and finding the label on the napkin to stalk me to come and try to have lunch with me. It was the creepiest thing Base ever. Sigma and I told him, of course set. not. Please, like, leave me alone. This is really creepy and weird. And after I said no to him and said, I don't want to have coffee with you after you've stalked me to a cafe in Vienna, I started seeing this guy come out with all of these videos about how I'm a horrible, evil con artist. <laughs> like, I didn't even find it until now, but he actually even sent me a DM saying, Lauren, can we hang out in Vienna? Where are you? But think about how f***ed up that is. This is once again one of these situations where this person who exudes this personality of, I, I care about the red pill, I care about what the truth you the people need to hear, actually bases all of their politics off of their own personal experiences and whether they attack someone or not has nothing to do with whether they're doing good work, whether they're actually trying to get out there and tell the truth, but has everything to do with whether they feel personally scorned or not, whether they can make money, whether they can get sex off something. It's all about them. That's what they base their politics on. Anyways, speaking of scorned people, as I mentioned, Milo would always get his quotes or blackmail from someone who he felt would give him information, like when he called me about Alam, when he called Faith about me, right? It's who are the people that hate this person that are gonna give me the, the worst, most exaggerated false interpretation that I can get to publish in my article or ruin their career. And I'll just read some of these interesting quotes. He got Laura Loomer, for example, who said, speaking of me, it's a shame that her quest for fame and fortune overrode loyalty to those who facilitated the rise in her career. Then there's Faith, who of course stated, Lauren didn't know or care what they were doing of Kaylin and George with Milo stretching her words to make the implication that uh, Southern was in on it. This giant Antifa plan, right? And lastly, he quoted a former friend um, who is unidentified, <laughs> who states, 
Trust me. Wait, Destiny, can you please acknowledge that all of the culturally significant right-wing media is produced by women and gay men? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what's going on, dude. It's a wacky world out there, guys. It's just, it's just a wacky world out there. I, I don't, I don't know what else to say. Who knows what's real anymore? And lastly, he quoted a former friend um, who is unidentified, <laughs> who states, trust me. And then if you want to find, and then, the, and then the opposite irony part, if you want to find like the whitest collection of like spoiled rich people, you just have to go into the rooms of some of the wokest places to find. <laughs> Where are all the white straight men at? Uh, you mean the pansexual non-binaries? Uh, because they're over there at a UC, whatever, you know, just kidding, in a video game. You knew about everything. Why do you think she's quitting journalism? Who retires at 26? Her retirement isn't about making babies. Twitter is like, like overwhelmingly overrepresented by like white educated people. Meanwhile, like conservative groups are so desperate for people. They're like trying to be more diverse and multicultural. How many like Fuentes convos have like a black guy, a Hispanic guy? Like people are making arguments where like, well, you know, maybe we should one drop rule in the other direction. If you're black or Hispanic, there's some room for you here. As long as you acknowledge the rest of you guys are gross. Like, I, I don't know, it's funny to me. Never mind. in a video game. Babies. It's about dodging bull. 26. Her retirement isn't about making babies. It's about dodging bullets. Now, this former friend is almost 100% Milo Yiannopoulos, because of course, and this is what makes it extra, extra insidious, Milo knew why I was quitting. He knew I was quitting because of my family. He knew I was quitting because I needed my visa. And he knew I couldn't respond to any of this. So he knew he could make comments as sick as this, to say the opposite of what had actually happened and completely get away with it. To wrap this stuff up, like, this may not seem like a big deal to people watching because obviously it's old news. No one's really talking about that crazy article years ago anymore. But at the time, it was huge. Everyone was talking about it. I had massive figures with hundreds of thousands of views talking about how I was this Antifa spy. It was all over Twitter. I couldn't respond to anything, but my whole Twitter timeline was all these people who were previously fans saying, how dare I betray the entire movement? Even when I made my coming back video saying, hey guys, I've returned to politics. Uh, not saying much because I was worried about my visa status. Um, everyone in the comments, thousands of comments of people saying, we know you screwed over Tommy Robinson. We know you did X, Y, Z. So many people believed this at the time. And I cannot, I cannot even begin to explain how it feels to have to leave politics because you are being punished by a government for speaking out about issues you deeply, deeply care about, sacrificing your life, your career, your ability to see family and friends, to travel. I was banned from the US for two years, holy. Sacrificing all of this and being forced to quit because of all those sacrifices I made for something I truly, truly believed in. And then to have that silence, that forced silence from the government be used to turn everyone that I had fought for against me and to have everyone say I was a fraud. <laughs> like, I can't even begin to explain how that makes one feel. My biggest regret, uh, I've always felt like all of this is just too much to explain. Too much to explain, too complicated. I'm gonna have so many people come after me legally for talking about this stuff. I'm gonna have, you know, the government come after me for talking about what they did to me. I, I was so scared to talk about all of this for so long, but I really, really deeply regret that I didn't make this my comeback video and just tell you all what had happened. And I'm sorry for that. I genuinely am sorry. I, it is, I was really angry with a lot of people who just believed all of these things with no evidence. I was really angry at can you be banned from a country for any lefty positions? So I, I can't speak to like the legality of it, but um, you know how like cops in the United States can exercise a lot of discretion when it comes to like pulling you over for a traffic stop? Like imagine that except like a million times more, except you don't even have to be accused of a crime when it comes to immigration. Um, I can't speak to the, I, I can only speak to my own experiences and like Melina's experiences and people I've heard traveling, but like 
whether or not you get into a country is fully at the discretion of whoever the particular agent is that either stamps your passport or decides to interview you, um, I'm pretty sure they have the discretion to turn you away for literally whatever fucking reason they want. And you just fuck, like you don't have to, like that's it. I don't think you get like a day in court or there's like some, you know, uh, redress or these are my grievances. How to, like, um, I'm pretty sure like when it comes to immigration, getting into or out of a country, you <clears throat> they might just turn you away for whatever fucking reason and that's it. But my audience, a lot of people. And I, I kind of set that aside though. And I remembered the things I believed about Margaret. I remember the things I believed about Alam. I remember believing these things just because Milo said them, right? So what ground do I have to stand on to be mad at other people for just believing this big figure, especially when I didn't tell my side of the story. And I'm sorry that I'm just getting the bravery now to talk about it because I probably could have done a lot more good if I had just been honest about this all from the start. Apparently I could be honest about every single thing in politics that I saw. Wait, do you think this was like a Milo the Mastermind type of thing or more of a good old boys club with Tommy, Milo, etc.? cetera? Um, okay, we read an article a while ago by that Slate Star Codex guy and he was really good at putting into words something that has to do with conspiracies. Um, he put this into words better than I can, so I'm stealing his explanation now. You don't need conspiracies to explain people doing what they would naturally do anyway. Um, so like um, a good example might be like maybe the Trump Russia collusion stuff, right? That like, you know, would, would people in Trump staff reach out to, you know, Russia sources they could for some sort of benefit? Yeah, of course they would because they're all incentivized to do so. Yeah, no shit. You don't even need like a master great plan to, to even say that these types of things happen. And some people did reach out and some people did talk to people relating to Russian stuff. Um, when it comes to do with like clout sharks or these big like groups of people that exclude other people, you don't, they're at, you don't need to say that like in order for this to happen, you've got to show me a grand conspiracy. All you need to show is that like, yeah, everybody's kind of incentivized to act in a certain way. Um, like, let's say hypothetically, let's say that I were to go to Austin for whatever reason, and I find that like every single place I go to, every streamer is like, no, like, I'm not doing anything with you. I don't want to talk to you, blah, 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 blah. Like on one hand, I might think that like um, maybe Casey Tron or Cutie Cinderella is like orchestrating this grand plot behind the scenes. They've reached out and meticulously communicated to everybody. Like Steven's going to be here at this time. Make sure that you reject him, blah, 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 blah. Like people might, that might be like an idea that you get where you, um, in your mind, you're thinking like, okay, there's a big plan going on here. Or like in Lawrence video, like uh, there's a big plan with Milo here. But in reality, every single person is just kind of incentivized to play a certain role because it benefits them the most. Um, so like for me, it's like, well, you know that I don't get along well with Hassan, Ludwig, or Cutie. You know these guys have like a lot of influence behind the scenes. So like, it's pretty easy to not want to associate with me for that type of reason. There doesn't need to be a grand conspiracy. And then same thing here in, um, I'm guessing in like the conservative world, where like if you have a couple of big figures like Milo, if Milo calls you up and he's trying to get dirt on somebody, or if somebody seems to be crossing paths with him, well, this guy is like the player right now. He's like one of the big stars. Like, yeah, I'm probably gonna align myself with him. I'm not even trusting him because he's more believable because he's more popular, so it gives him more credibility. It's more just it serves my interest to do so, you know? Um, yeah, I think um, sometimes a lot of people can court can seemingly coordinate in ways um, where it seems like there's a master architect to what's going on. But if you look at everybody's incentives, you can see that there are ways where everybody can act in a way that almost betrays like a conspiracy. But in reality, people are just incentivized to act a certain way, you know? Except about the corruption in my own political. Every single thing in politics that I saw except about the corruption in my own political movement because that was hard they're my team they were the only thing i had standing with me against the world and i didn't want to break that i would rather lose my reputation and i would rather have everyone hate me than to attack this entity i believed in so much but honestly now looking back at it it needed it needed a cleanse and a lot of people look at this and they they look back on 2016 they look back on the dissident right with a lot of nostalgia and they think it's such a shame that all of this went away, that it was censored and attacked by the government and all of these NGOs and that it was dismantled so unjustly. And I hope you can kind of understand why I- What color is Lauren's hair, hair here? Is it blonde or brown? I think you would call this a dirty blonde, right? I don't have that same nostalgia. I don't. And I actually think that the dissident right failed because the world is a just place.
And that's a scary thing for me to say. I am sorry that the people who represented you were so f***ed up and squandered so much of your money and trust, and that- How did she not know there was corruption? I think that generally, when you're in certain groups, I think you usually want to believe the best in people. Actually, I can back up and make that more broad. Um, as human creatures, you are wired to trust everybody. That's how scamming works, that's how abuse works, that's how like everything in society works. You're, you're generally by default wired to trust people. Um, when you get into like in-groups, you're wired to trust people even more. That's just kind of a natural, it's a very human inclination to do that. Um, for people that are distrustful, usually that's a maladaptive behavior that's a sign of like extensive abuse in their background. Um, people are just by default very trusting. So when, you, um, when you're part of a group and they share political ideals, and you're kind of unified against like a common enemy on the outside, the idea that some particular person in that group could also be betraying you, you will do a lot of mental gymnastics to make it so that that can't possibly be the case. Um, you will very quickly invent a ton of explanations for why they might have acted improperly there, why they did an immoral thing there, why it seemed like they fucked you over, but there's probably a good reason for it. You'll go through a lot of excuses, kind of like how like a battered housewife or house husband might make a, probably a housewife, right? It's probably gonna make excuses of, well, he only hits me because I'm drunk, it's because I didn't fix the stuff in the house, it's because I, you know, I shouted and I shouldn't have. Like people, when, when it comes to groups that they trust, people will invent a lot of reasons for why they, um, people will invent a lot of reasons for why they, why they can get fucked over, but it's okay and it wasn't the person's fault that time, you know? Is what? That's why I don't have that same nostalgia and it was my job, it was my- Do you think Lefty's gonna cover Lauren's vid to watch righty infighting or just ignore it because she's not as clean? I have no idea, but the thing that sucks the most about these types of things um, coming out on either political side is it ends up becoming a lot of people don't empathize with your struggle it just becomes ammunition for the other group so like for instance if you go through like my KF thread I'm sure there are pros and fortune I haven't read recently um, but a lot of people like look at my stories and be like uh, yeah of course these people are backstabbing you they're crazy lefties like oh it's all proving it's all confirming that we knew these people were crazy like this is your fault you did this blah 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 that's generally how it goes and obviously your side won't support you while you're attacking your side the other side will just weaponize your complaints as ammunition so it's kind of you just kind of like get fucked <laughs> like all, all around from everything but I, that's generally how it works my job to tell you all this stuff it was my job to tell you the truth but it was so hard to spoil what so many people believed in at the time it was really hard for me to do and i'm only just kind of getting the confidence to do that i think some of the most broken people get involved in politics for exactly that reason they're broken and they want to know why they're broken and why the world is so broken around them um, but it doesn't change the fact that so many horrible things were done and I, I hope that some of you understand why I've come and taken a bit more nuanced approach to things after cults of personality and just believing what the right wing said did so much harm to me. Not actually being critical of your own side did so much harm to me and people I care about. So as much as I do believe in the ideals of, of conservatism, I'm very critical as well. I'm very, very critical for exactly these reasons and the experiences I've been through. So. That's part of why I hate, kind of hate the leopard state my face meme because like it encourages people to not come forward with fuck shit because people essentially victim blame since they couldn't insta judge character magically. A little bit, yeah. Um, and then also people forget that um, it's so, so, so strange. And it's why I wonder sometimes what's going on in people's heads. Um, people, I don't know who understands what of anything versus who's just like parroting stuff they've heard. Because it feels like sometimes when you talk to progressives, like they will have the best understanding of how environment can shape a person's perspective on the world. Like, wow, another absent black father or black criminal. And then a person will be like, hold on, dude, it's not that simple, okay? Like the proclivities for this kind of behavior have been embedded in this culture, uh, you know, since the days of slavery. There are people's grandparents who weren't able to attend a non-segregated school. There are people whose parents haven't been able to buy property because they've been refused for being a Negro. They cannot buy property in a certain area of a, of a city. And for all of this stuff, there are black people who only need two or three negative experiences with a cop. You had legalized stop and frisk in New York. Like, of course these things are gonna contribute to people like committing crime crime and you know sometimes you have others it's not good and it's like okay cool you have a really you okay you have a decent understanding of it. this is a complicated thing um here's a racist conservative <laughs> that's because they're fucking evil they're actually just fascist nazi evil evil fucks they're evil and it's like oh okay so <laughs> well what happened to the whole lots of different things can shape your perspective on the world but 
no they're transphobic and evil because they're evil satan spawn it's like okay well okay <laughs> i guess sure sounds about wow. right it's getting dark out i've been talking to y'all all day i did not i should have known this video was going to take this long to film it's it's a lot but it's still not over somehow fast forward to 2020 I'm a mom now life's changed a lot I'm in Australia and I finally got news that I was on a more substantial visa, one that was not going to be compromised by this vacuum stuff. And I got to this point where I was like, I can talk to you guys again. I can do what I love. I can speak about the world and the issues that I cared about. Politics scared me at that point still, everything I'd been through, but I, I wanted to come back. I wanted to come back and talk to you all again. And I, I made that video, why I left and why I'm back, where I wasn't entirely honest. Told you the truth, but I left out most of it. My fault. And when I finally got the courage to at least return, I wasn't quite ready to talk about all this stuff. Uh, who came out of the woodworks? I'd already talked about Tommy, I already talked about Faith, I already talked about Milo and all these people that I looked up to so much as heroes in the dissident right that had just destroyed and blackpilled my brain on politics. And of course, one more had to come out for a final backstab and it was none other than Paul Joseph okay. Watson. <laughs> I got worried for a second there. <laughs> Jesus. After I came out with my video saying, I'm back to talk to you guys again. I just want to deal with the truth. I want to make documentaries again. I want to just have this cultural conversation, do what I love. Um, of course, I had all of the people that still believe the Milo article. I honestly, I, I knew it was a big deal when it came out, but I didn't think there would be that many people that still remembered it and thought about it, but there were. There were a lot of people who still believed it uncritically at the time. And one person that was right out of the gate, ready to slam down that narrative again was Paul who, right when I made my video, decided to tweet out, right-wing YouTuber suddenly returns, claiming to be nuanced centrist, which I never said, having disappeared at the exact point where everyone else was fucked over and banned for the last 18 months, having thrown them under the bus by funding the very people responsible. I think some of Paul's text messages have been leaked publicly read. These are unhinged. The messages that I've seen of this dude, Fuck, I wish I had a link to the tweets before. I don't know, maybe it was the one who posted them. Um, there was at least one tweet I saw where, <laughs> oh my God. Responsible for all that. Inauthentic. And this was just one of many tweets he sent about me that day saying I was a grifter, I was inauthentic, I was an evil Antifa spy, all of this stuff. The only real accusation I could discern from Paul's cocaine fueled rants about me on Twitter was that I had retired at the exact moment when Infowars and all these other people were being banned. And to that, I would say I deeply apologize that my pregnancy and visa issues were so rude as to not pay attention to the news cycle. But the funny thing about this is the exact thing that Paul is attacking me for here, the exact issue that he is bemoaning me for, is exactly what Paul did at the time. In fact, Alex Jones reached out to Kaylin right when Infowars was being banned off everything and said this, Paul has gotten real tense about promoting Infowars or anything now that this ban has happened and he's not being really responsive. So it's all this timidness and other stuff, Alex complained in a voice note. Everyone else I work with is starting to get really nebulous. So to- Oh shit, it was this. Now it is possible that maybe messages were deleted on the other side. Well, so you can't act, so does when you can't answer, maybe not, I don't know, but um, I feel like any time you're sending messages like this, it's time to take a step back and realize that you might be a little bit unhinged. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Paul, for this accusation, I say, physician, heal thyself. You have almost completely cut yourself off from Infowars to protect yourself, and you have the audacity to- Oh, those last eight messages were, messages were all within one minute, gotcha. Accuse me of doing just that. 
But worse than all that is why Paul is attacking me. Because of course, of course, when we're dealing with these figures from the dissident right, it can't just be that he has this true faith and needs to find the frauds in the movement to expose them to the right. No, there has to be a personal factor to it. Well, imagine my shock. Imagine my shock. Imagine my shock. Well, imagine my shock. Or imagine. I don't like to talk about these things publicly. I don't think it is good manners in any regard, but my father always told me, Lauren, don't start a fight, but finish one. <sighs> so the last time I saw Paul Joseph Watson, we went on a date. Perhaps my worst crime in politics. Uh, he took me to a restaurant in Battersea. It was horrendous dinner conversation, if I'm being honest, but uh, we went back to his flat chatted for a few hours, had cigars, and he wanted to sleep with me, like a good conservative influencer, right? And I'm no saint, I'm not a perfect person, and I'm not gonna pretend to be. But at that time, I had absolutely decided I was looking for something serious. I wanted a family. I didn't want just a one night stand. So I told Paul that. I said, you know what? No, I'm sorry, I'm looking for something serious. And he walked me to his door, questioned me a few times on it, asked me to stay, and I said, no. Goodbye, I'm leaving. And ever since that day I rejected him, I have received nothing but insanity from the man, from crazy text messages at four in the morning, cocaine-fueled rants that go on for hours, sending me Kanye lyrics, asking me to go on dates with him in Europe. It has- We need new text messages, come on. Genuinely been insane. And of course, spreading gossip that I'm a Antifa spy, a slut, a whore, all of these things, because what better name to call a girl who won't sleep with you than a whore, right? But just, I have never, ever seen a man react so badly to rejection. I've never seen a man act so jilted, so scorned. And you know what, Paul? Also, yeah, true, which Kanye lyrics? That's kind of important. If you want to deny any of this, if you want to pretend that you truly were on some moral crusade against the, the frauds and the inauthentic people in the movement, as if you don't have a few things to say about that, you can deny all of this. And I'd be happy, more than happy, to provide more evidence for it. But I don't think you want me to do that. So we'll just leave that there. This is the guy you had a recording of talking at a party, right? That some woman emailed me, yeah. Was it, was it was it when Sargon was doing the UKIP run that he'd made that comment about how, like, nobody wants to rape you? <laughs> oh, man. No, that was before? Oh, was it before the UKIP thing? It might have been before the UKIP thing. Maybe it just got, it came up when he was running for it. Okay. I'll be honest with you all. Half of this is for selfish reasons. I don't even know if I'd say selfish. I just want to tell my side of the story. I just finally want people to hear my side, because I've stayed silent for so long and I have so much to tell, and this is only 1% of it, if that. And then the other half is genuinely for you. You deserve to hear all of this. You deserve to hear the truth of what was going on behind the scenes, and my loyalty to this movement, not wanting to expose these people that so many people look up to, not wanting to talk about the truth of conservatism because we've got the left to go after. We've got all this insane, insane progressivism to go after. We can't be infighting. What happened is that by ignoring the problems in my own side to try to protect it, I just allowed a lot of toxicity to corrode it from the inside. And it collapsed anyways. It collapsed anyways, and deservingly so. I can't sit here and pretend like the larger half of what happened to the dissident right wasn't entirely their own fault. You can't fix anything if you don't admit to yourself that you had fault. You can't. The selfishness, the ego, the cult of personality. Believing people just because they were big and famous and leaders of the movement. <sighs> that was what was our downfall. That was the downfall of the dissident right. And all I can do is hope that maybe out of its ashes, we can create something more genuine. You guys, the actual people who this is about can make something more genuine because it's, it's us over here, the figures, me not telling you any of this, me covering it all up to protect my side, that was up. That was me f***ing up. Everyone else doing things for fame, ego, and money, not everyone, but a lot of people, f*** up. F*** ups that no one wanted to acknowledge, no one wanted to talk about. Swearing not good. We on the right talk 
all day about the problems with the corporate media. And we're right, there are problems. They are silencing people, covering up stories, lying about facts. They've got all sorts of nefarious figures funding their journalism, all sorts of nefarious figures Echoes. reporting the news that have all of this horrible stuff about them covered up. And, and we're right to talk about that. But how can we claim to be any better when we have the same sort of stuff happening on our own side and have for years? One of the things that Paul Joseph Watson tweeted when I came back was, Lauren has one chance to bend the knee to me or I'm gonna expose everything on her. I never bent the knee to him and he never exposed anything on me, but I've certainly had those threats made before and being more serious. And I've certainly, even if they didn't have anything on me, they'd just publish lies like Milo did, right? Uh, to be honest, behind the scenes in the dissident right, it felt a lot like one big Mexican standoff. Everyone holding blackmail on each other saying, if you don't support me, no matter what I do, no matter how much money I steal or what I do wrong, well, I got this blackmail gun on you. You did cocaine with me this day. You saw a hooker with me that day. You did like everyone's just got blackmail guns on each other saying, you better stick to the script or else. And there's no way that anyone can be honest in that environment. No way, especially when you get excommunicated from your audience, your audience get told you're a fraud. If I think that was actually one of the biggest reasons that Kaylin, George and I were probably kicked out of the right and had so much lies spread about us was because we knew too much and we didn't want to be a part of it anymore. We didn't want to talk to anyone anymore. We didn't want to be involved. We just wanted to do our own thing and we knew too much. And if you're not going to be a part of it, if you try to walk away from the Mexican standoff, well, everyone's going to turn their guns to you and shoot you, right? And you're not going to have an audience. You're not going to have people to, well, everyone's going to look and be like, why, why are all of these wonderful figures that do nothing wrong and have nothing wrong with them? Why do they all hate you? Why do they all hate you? Right? But yeah. I'm glad that I had to quit for a bit looking back as much as it was hard. Um, it was good to be back in the real world and I'm, I'm far more connected to the real world now than, than I was before and that's important because I can actually ground myself. There's far too little grounding involved in, in being a public figure and a political figure and it's all, people lose themselves. These, these people and these figures you watch, they aren't perfect people. I'm not a perfect person. And you, know, you never want to disappoint your audience. You never want them to look at you and think like, I believed in you. I believed that you were like this hero. Like so many people have disappointed me. Um, but I think that was the mistake from the start was trying to be heroes instead of just being people that are confused and broken in this world as well and trying to make sense of it all and just being honest. And hopefully I'll get to be more honest going forward and hopefully maybe this video will convince more people to be more honest going forward about everything that's going on in the background. But yeah, I love you all. I care for you. I've cared for you the whole time. I've never been a fraud or lying. I've never wanted to hurt any of you. I really, really, really believed in this all. And I'm, I'm sorry that I've probably hurt a lot of you by keeping this all to myself, but it felt good to say it. It felt good to say it all. I'm telling you, you're coming along in a very dangerous time. Oh my God, she needs to have the uh, the Hulk music, the Hulk walking away music.